Hello, peoples, and welcome to Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we take two random films from the cinematic multiverse and discuss the hell out of them. Uh, we do an interesting thing at the end where we're going to take a look and compare and contrast those two random films, see how they may or may not be similar and different. So hopefully we've got an interesting episode for you today. This is episode two. I am Jason Peters, and with me today is my co-host and good buddy, Ryan Siebold. Ryan, how you doing? I'm doing all right, Jason. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, man. Doing good. I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to this episode. Um, I know you're going to tell us about the films here in a minute. I mean, on the surface, these are two films that just couldn't be more different. Um, Ryan, why don't you tell us about the films? Well, first off, uh, I want to... Uh kind of explain to our listeners. So Jason and I, when, when Jason approached me with this podcast concept, he had asked me to uh, kick down some ideas for the list uh, to contribute to what we would be watching. Uh, both of these were my uh, choices. Uh, we've also <laughs> asked the listeners to contribute in the future and get on us, uh, get at us on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, but uh, at Esoterica Cinema. But uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to come out uh, right away and apologize uh, for <laughs> making you watch Fritz the Cat. We got two movies today. Fritz the Cat, which I mistakenly called Felix the Cat. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the first one to ever do that. Um, I went to go watch Felix the Cat. This is not at all the movie I thought it was about to be on YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> that was a dude. Uh, right. Uh, I'm like, wait, I thought there was boobs in this. And uh, qu spoiler alert: yes, there is boobs. <laughs> there are boobs. Uh, right. We'll get into that momentarily. Plenty more. <laughs> Fritz the Cat is a 1972 American adult uh, animated comedy film written and directed by Ralph Bakshi based on the comic strip by Robert Crumb. Uh, the film focuses on Fritz the Cat, a uh, glib, womanizing, and fraudulent cat, an anthropomorphic uh, animal version of New York City uh, during the mid-1960s. And then they go on a road trip and they go across the country. They encounter all kinds of uh, characters like African-American crows and uh, starts a race riot. I mean, it's just... It becomes a leftist revolutionary. Uh, this movie is absolutely bananas. It uh, belongs on our list, but I'm going to apologize for making you watch it anyways. I'm glad I finally got to see it. I had never seen this film. Did you, Jason? No, I hadn't, you know, and it's one of these things. I mean, you know, you're saying like, look, it's not a good film. I really did not like it whatsoever. But at the same time, it's totally one of those films that I'm glad to have seen. Right. Like it's just one of those films that's in discussion for important films in cinema, just especially with its relation to, um, you know, adult animation. And I'm not going to pretend like it didn't make some headway for the genre of adult animation, which I love in television form. Like, I'm not super into adult animated films, but I love The Simpsons, Futurama, you know, Brick and Morty, all those things. I know you do as well. Um, so, you know, but it was not an enjoyable film. It's a film whose moral compass is definitely not align to a 2020 mindset which some people may find refreshing i kind of found it a little distasteful at times and look i'm somebody that likes poking the bear too i mean i get you know holding a mirror up to society and hey you know here's all the ugliness that we're not willing to acknowledge like i totally like i do sort of i guess appreciate where they came from with it but i can't say i, was no, no, very I mean much this into this movie to me was this movie to me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this movie no, to please. me was like the 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 two live crew of animated films. Like it <laughs> needed to be done. It fought for a lot of uh, uh, freedoms within the animated culture that we now take for granted. Uh, it made way for things like South Park and The Simpsons uh, yeah. to a certain degree. Um, and even uh, like Beavis and Butthead and Adult Swim and all these crazy, uh, all this cr animated craziness now that we see and we're bombarded with mm -hmm. uh, all kind of stemmed from this. And it was a r deemed rated X, which, by the way, uh, I don't know if you watched the rating placard at the end of the film. Uh, but it said no children under 16. So apparently ra really? rated X was 16 and up back then. Crazy. Huh. Um, maybe, I mean, unless I misread that, but that's. <laughs> no, that's, I'll take your word uh, for it. I certainly know. wasn't paying attention to that. No, but. Uh, Gotta yeah. love 1972. So uh, yeah, this was like the two live crew of animated films. <laughs> um, it was unabashedly, uh, you know, uh, explicit. Uh, I think right out the gate, I need to know if we're going to talk about, uh, if we're going to refer to them as boobs or tits or breasts, <laughs> we need to come up with a, an yeah, acceptable it's... nomenclature on how we're going to do this. Um, but otherwise, uh, maybe you could just play a, sure. yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a big part of it. 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, before we continue, so um, I actually do have the trailer that I want to play for people just to kind of give them a little taste Great. of what's ahead. Um, before we do continue, though, let me just remind everyone. So this is less a film review podcast and more a film discussion podcast. The reason I distinguish between those two is that there will be spoilers in these episodes. There's just no way to talk about the types of creative decisions that we want to look at and the level of artistry and all of those things that come along with really breaking down a film. That's what we want to do. We want to really look at films in a way that nobody else is doing right now, and we just can't do that without talking about spoilers. So if you have not seen these films, once again, Fritz the Cat and Swiss Army Man, uh, feel free to go ahead and stop this episode and check them out. All of the films that we discuss here on this program are available online. Uh, if they're not free, you know, you can rent them for a nominal fee. You can find them on Google, Letterboxd, whatever your favorite platform is. Um, but every film that, uh, that's on our list that we choose from is going to be something that you can relatively easy, easily find online. So Fritz the Cat is actually available for free on Amazon Prime as of this recording. And Swiss Army Man is included with your Netflix subscription. So you shouldn't really have to pay anything extra to check out both of these films and participate in this discussion with us. So with that being said, let's go ahead and play you a small clip of Fritz the Cat. Could I get to search the girls? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't need nothing that. Hey, you old scroungy old alley cat, get out of them garbage cans, ha huh? Talking to me, Jack? What the hell are you doing there anyway? Hey, man, here we are in the brink of the apocalypse, the eve of destruction, so to speak. And I can't think of anything to do. Well, offhand, son, I'd say you have got a problem. Yeah. Ha ha. But at least you're honest. The revolution can use a man like you. Hey. Hop on. Far out. Okay, so that should give you a little taste of what Oof. the film is. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, now, hey, hey uh, Ryan, one thing I do want to mention. So, um, you know, last episode, you and I had that sort of discussion. We were talking about whether it's Bakshi or Crumb, Bakshi or Crumb. So I checked it out. The film was actually both written and directed by Ralph Bakshi, but it was adapted yes. from a comic strip by Harry Crumb. So that right. kind of answers the confusion that we had there. Um, and, uh, and Crumb Ryan, hated this movie, from what I understand. From what I read, he tried to get his name re removed from this, said, those aren't my characters that I created and uh, this is exploitative and, and all of that. So um, I, I read that they that they agreed to do that, but the print was already made. So they're like, ah, fuck it. And then that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I had heard the same. Apparently, um, Harry Crumb was super far left and didn't like a lot of the sort of ribbing and poking that the film makes about the political left. Um, I think that there also is some pointed criticism at the political right. Um, but probably trends a little bit more towards the left uh, in terms of who it kind of pokes fun at. Um, but that being said, uh, I don't think that, again, there's a, there's a right and wrong way to do things. I don't know that this film does it the right way, but let's just kind of, so let's let's begin with where we start, right? So there's this sort of open, opening, tra uh, not a tracking shot, but it's an opening wide angle of this city at night, and it's kind of rainy, and we get these three construction workers that are sitting, you know, up top on the crane. And one of them's just kind of complaining about his daughter being in college. Like, it's kind of, I don't know, it sounded like one of those just, like, boomer sort of complaining about millennials type conversations. But it was happening, like, whatever, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, however long. So, obviously, history repeats itself. We, don't, we all know that. And I thought that was kind of interesting to notice on this. But right off the bat... The one thing that I noticed the most is that, oh my god, this film not only looks like shit, but it sounds like shit. And Ryan, you're 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 an audio guy. That's that's how you make your cheese. And I, I have to imagine listening to this film must have been just death for you because it sounds like every you know, it's, single. It harkens sound. back to an older time. This is uh you know this is like Schoolhouse Rock. This is uh the animation was really rough around the edges. It looked like an old Saturday morning cartoon almost, um, or something. Uh, uh, you know, oh, what are those two guys that did Land of the Lost? Like one of their type uh, animations from uh, the Banana Show, whatever the heck. Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the the audio uh, from what I read because I was curious about this and. Um, 
they just kind of slapdash this together. And often, oftentimes they threw um, just random people into a studio and had them riff about stuff. There was no uh, script uh, in a lot of times. And just because the budget was so nil. And so they uh, didn't have a lot to go on, just topics they wanted covered. And uh, so a lot of what you're hearing, from what I understand, was was uh, oftentimes improv or ad-libbed by... Uh, you know, random people that, that he knew. And, and Bakshi, uh, I think actually did that opening monologue that you hear yes. from the construction worker that, uh, takes a leak off the, off the <laughs> onto the heads of the hippies, the no good liberal hippies. So here's right, the thing. Right. And, it, and, and they're like, right away, we're seeing a huge, uh, marquee for, it just says Bible and it's right next to a strip club. And it kind of <laughs> lets you know what you're in store for. I don't know if you caught that. It's like a slow push on a, um, uh, a static shot of New York City, and uh, we're we're pushing into um, one of the boroughs, and and yeah, it says Bible, and it's right next to a strip club, and and then we we cut to these three anthropomorphic animal types, and in the one voiced by Bakshi, he's going on this monologue, and then he ends up yeah. So uh, here's the thing, man. The so I'll I'll do you one further. So I actually uh, I did a little bit of research on this as well. So part absolutely what you're talking about about bringing in random people and whatnot to do some of the sound like that's 100 percent spot on. But in addition to that, so Bakshi was like one of these guys where it's like, nah, man, you know, animation. Like he was trying to rebel against Disney and like the the polish of a lot of animation at the time. And so he actually took like a little like I don't know the equivalent of like a Tascam voice recorder or something like that. And would just go out to the streets of New York and find random people on the streets and record them talking just into right. some random mic. So he actually went out and got a bunch of this dialogue because, again, he wanted to be gritty. He wanted to be real. But, you know, you've got background noise. You've got static hiss. You've got people that are difficult to understand. Cars going on in the background. So he went out and recorded all this footage himself. And when he brought it to the sound engineers, they were pissed off, dude. Like they were like, what is this? We <laughs> can't with work this? with this. This makes you look bad. This makes us look bad. You need to re-record all of this with actors inside of a studio so it doesn't sound like dog shit. And Bakshi just doubled down and was like, nah, man, we're trying to go for real. We want it to be authentic. And so he refused much to the chagrin of all the different sound engineers. And I think that the movie suffers for that. Look, I get from an artistic standpoint what you're trying to do, but film has basic mechanics for a reason. And it, the film suffers because we have... I, I would say roughly 15% of this film is absolutely impossible to understand. Like, there's a scene later where there's a bunch of rabbis and they're talking about something... I had no idea what it was. I had to look it up after the fact to see what the hell they said across four and a half minutes, five and a half minutes. Like, it's egregious, and the film suffers because of it. I would tend to agree. There are some moments, though, that, uh, like, like some of the stuff that is happening in Harlem, some of the conversations in the pool hall, uh, I did like the uh, organic nature of it and the fact that it's all real. They're playing pool. Like all the noise that's coming around, uh, you know, some of the street noise, like you said, um, it just, it, it was neat to me to imagine him out with a Nagra audio recorder, walking the streets of Harlem, recording uh, dialogue or, or interviewing these people and getting their points of view about things politically or uh, systematically. Um, by the way, themes that are still relevant uh, that we're dealing with in our current culture, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, so, that was crazy. Uh, it was just kind of neat to be like, get that man on the street kind of um, live. I mean, you just, I've never heard that before. You're absolutely right. And yeah, it, the quality is shit, but the experience uh, of it was interesting to me, to say the least. Yeah. And I think people um, back then too weren't as maybe hung up on quality, especially any theater that was going to show Fritz the cat. I, you know, <laughs> I don't think they were, this, <laughs> we're not going to marquee places. This is probably, you know, shown in Times Square in New York, which back then was, uh, you know, strip clubs and peep shows and, and uh, hustlers and drug dealers and pimps. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't think this is going to be, you know, live at the Pantages or live at the Arclight, you know, um, maybe it is now, but, I think the theater experience was overlooked personally. I think it was, 
uh, more about the you know the experience of bringing the viewer into the world and uh, kind of showing them through animated characters um, polarizing views of the adventures of this cat that we get to go on a little adventure with uh, through all these subcultures more or less and kind of the uh, underbelly seedy underbelly of our of our society. Yeah, it would have been interesting to be part of that audience that saw, you know, like I, I honestly have no idea, you know, what the politics of 1972 really was like on a mainstream sort of level, you know, how audiences might have responded to this. Obviously, we know what the counterculture thinks of it, but with regard to sort of mainstream cinema, because this film went on to make $90 million, I believe, on a budget of 700000 So, I mean, a lot of people yeah. saw it. Yeah, I mean, two things. One, who gave him $700,000 in 1972? <laughs> that's even a lot of money. But yeah, then also, right? $90 million? I mean, that's just bananas in 1972 funds. I'd like to, well, for, for for next episode, we should uh, do a little calculating and, and figure out what, how that translates, like what kind of money that would be in today's dollars. I'd be curious to yeah. find out how it would sit against uh, some of today's top animated hits. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think... You know, if you're comparing it to Pixar, it's probably going to be way under. But uh, so I don't know, maybe a more fair comparison might be like some of the Don Bluth films of the 80s. You know, see what, you know, Secret of Nim and American uh, You know, Tale I'd be curious to see how it stood and... against movies like Team America World Police or, uh, you know, some of the um, maybe the more cutting it, you know, uh, rated R type uh, uh, cartoons or animated films as well. Sure. So. Something yeah, yeah, a little yeah. more adult based than Pixar. You're right. Because that would have a more broad audience, but this definitely did not. And being rated X, I mean, you know, there's only certain theaters that could pick that up. So, yeah. uh, you know, it had a tr- tremendous amount of success worldwide, too, I think, uh, as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, anyways, uh, yeah, we, we get with Fritz the cat and uh, we meet him after a very strange opening monologue that takes us uh, right into the heart of the film. And uh, we're with Fritz pretty much the rest of the film. And he is kind of the voice and, and eyes and ears of the audience um, for better or worse as he takes us through different subcultures from uh, Harlem to San Francisco and uh, on a crazy road trip up and down the coast of California through Hollywood and so on. So uh, anyways, uh, we get to meet all kinds of crazy characters. I thought uh, right out the gate we go to college. Uh, it was at NYU, I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. Fritz is a student at NYU mm-hmm. and he is uh, at a party uh, we kind of get to know him as a frat cat of sorts, <laughs> and um, he's at a party, he's doing drugs in the bathroom, he's looking for a place to hang out and get high, and uh, he's got some girls that he's met, and he, that he's brought with them, uh, brought with him, excuse me, and he's looking for a place to get, get stoned with them and, and enjoy, uh, what, a, what would you call it, a nice little orgy in a bathtub, or, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, I mean there's a... waste no time. <laughs> there's and it's weird because like you know again everything's anthropomorphic and like they're all different animals so it's kind of like a i don't know inner species orgy with like dogs and cats and uh, there's lizards that show up later and stuff pigs with the cops yeah. like so it's like muppet soup i mean this is just a <laughs> big totally bowl of is. naked muppets swirling around um yeah so let's talk and when about when you see the scene if you're if you're at home and you're listening to this or you're on the car in the car, do go watch this film. It's an hour and 18 minutes. Make sure no one's around because anyone that walks in on you, I don't care who it is. They could be your best friend. They see you watching this shit. They're going to be like, what in the world are you doing? And you will be infinitely scarred for life. Watch this in private. Lock your doors. Pull your shades. But enjoy. It's a good movie. <laughs> So let's talk about Fritz. So like we said, uh, Harry Crumb was sort of upset with the way that it sort of poked fun at a lot of sort of liberal ideology, especially. Um, there's, I think it, it, it sort of lets you, it, it lets you know what it is right off the bat, where there's that scene where the sort of uh, like almost SJW type girls are like trying to hit on the crow. Also, by the way, let's just preface this by saying that this film is very, you know, race related. Like it makes a lot of, you know, shock jokes about, you know, being white, black, Jewish, whatever. Um, You know, there's no way for us to discuss the film without talking about some of those elements. So 
we are going to, you know, try really hard to be respectful and, you know, not say anything that might offend some people, but just know that, you know, if we do talk about these things that, again, it's, it's central to the film and it just wouldn't be fair or right to completely ignore that. So we will bring things up, but again, we're just going to try to focus on what the film is saying about those things without interjecting our own politics, which are outside of what we want to discuss anyway. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, right off the bat, it kind of introduces the crows as a metaphor for the black population. And I don't know what culture was like at the time that this film came out, but to me, it doesn't really seem like it's a very flattering portrayal. Um, you know, well, again, Jason, this was a movie that Bakshi was thumbing his nose at the Disney culture. So if you recall in Dumbo, the crows were, uh, portrayed, uh, <laughs> were portraying African. No, no, I'm serious. No, they, I they know you're absolutely African right. Americans in Dumbo and they were yeah. on, you know, uh, that's by the way, if uh, I may interject real quick before you continue from Dumbo. On that. So like I'm that sorry, what? broke my heart, by the way, the crows. So as a child, like I loved Dumbo, right? And specifically I loved those crows. I thought those crows were so much fun and I loved hanging around with them and it absolutely broke my heart to like get older and realized that it's just this like really insensitive portrayal of African Americans and it's like really cuz like I liked those crows and now I can't hang out with those crows anymore and that makes me sad but at the same time I totally get it. I mean, I, I don't I don't think that uh that hang out with the crows, dude. Dumbo's a pussy. <laughs> yeah, man. It's just it's, it's it's just it's just hard. It's just hard knowing, like, you know what I mean? But take a negative stereotype and spin it, you know? I mean, don't <laughs> let that stop you. Whatever. Yeah. I so, agree. I agree. They had the coolest song in the whole in yeah, the whole, man. Uh, you know, feature. So Yeah, definitely. And that kind of, you know, I mean, kind of on that note, I think that one of the things that really bothered me about the film is it kind of it felt particularly juvenile from the standpoint of like it didn't really feel like it was trying to make a ton of statements. It's more just like the equivalent of shock humor or shock horror. Right. But on a sociopolitical level, uh, this where it's is like, a lot of the kind of stuff that that I would try to do back in film school is what, is what I wrote. <laughs> like this is. Jason and I have known each other since film school, and these were buttons that I was trying to push, you know, way back when I was a kid, just to see what you could get away with, almost. Yeah. And uh, there were a lot of missed opportunities because I think that there could have been statements made. Um, I don't know, you know. I but I also think that we weren't. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, no. I mean, it, it seems like one of those movies where it's just like, in, instead of you know making some profound statement about black culture, we're just gonna drop an end bomb, and that's gonna make us you know seem edgy and cool because you know we're not afraid to go there, and you know it's gonna make like it, it's not making clever jokes about like Jewish people, for example, like the fact that they say Jew is like the hook of the comedy. So it's like it's almost like the socio political equivalent of like pulling pigtails or flicking your brother's forehead or something like you're just pushing buttons for the sake of pushing buttons. And once right, you get past right. that, there's really not that much substance there. Not a lot of substance. Yeah. yeah. And, and Fritz himself. So what did you think of the character of Fritz himself? Let me ask you that. What do you mean? In what way? Okay. So specifically, let me, okay. Let me ask you this direct question. Like I wouldn't hang out with him. I'm not going to go, uh, you know, this guy's see trouble. Let me ask you this. <laughs> also, as he's an, a cat. I'm not as a cat, an cat. audience, are we supposed to like Fritz or are we supposed to dislike Fritz? So, uh, right. I think that there was a, a statement being made here. I was going to talk about this later when we compare the films, but uh, basically Fritz is um, the product of not, maybe uh, taking a stance and just going along with what society deals you. Uh, so you're just kind of in neutral and, and, and coasting along and, uh, and seeing things for what they are without. And if you're not helping the problem, then you're a part of the problem. And I, I genuinely noticed that to be an overall theme in the film, because every time he would get involved with certain characters that needed help or with certain characters that uh, were in a predicament or, uh, up against the wall, uh, he would try to get out of it because he was just looking for a good time and trying to be 
uh, like the dude from Big Lebowski or something and um, and be neutral. And he was just trying to get high and, and have fun. And time and time again, he would make matters worse yeah. by not helping. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you, did you get that feeling at all or am I... Yeah, well, so this is what I find interesting about the film is, like I said, you know, we do get some, you know, conservative ribbing in addition to a lot of the liberal ribbing. But what I find most interesting is, like, Fritz himself seems to be almost a distillation of the worst of both worlds. Like, I would say that if you would take arguably, you know, the lesser elements of liberalism and then arguably the lesser elements of conservatism... He embraces both of those aspects. So, you know, on the conservative side, he's like hugely anti-intellectual, at least, you know, seemingly on the surface. He goes on that huge, big rant. Um, And but then on the other hand, he turns around and he's like, yeah, you know, nobody should be reading books, blah, 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 waste of time. You need to go out there and you need to live and you need to do drugs and you need to bang women. And it's like, well, so wait, this is. You're going to rebel against like, you know, intellectualism and but your response is to go out and get high and bang like that doesn't really seem like it's an altruistic position to take. Right. So it seems like it's this weird sort of push and pull where he will talk shit over here on the one end, but then like his alternative really isn't any better. And it seems really selfishly motivated and it seems like he's trying to intellectualize and justify like at the end of the day just not really working or having purpose or any of those things um we'll talk about this more in a minute i actually right now have a clip that i want to play for you of the anti-intellectual rant that he goes on so this will give you a sort of a sense um for what it's worth it's it's really not a bad i did kind of enjoy the monologue for what it was but when you hold it up against the rest of his decisions It just kind of seems like he's always trying to get out of doing work and putting in any sort of effort. Like, it's very much that kind of almost, like, shitty teenager type thing where it's just like, uh, effort is, effort's so uncool, you know? And that's just something where, you know, when once you get older and you realize how much effort, like, even the most minimal of accomplishments takes, right? You, it's just a behavior that I don't necessarily enjoy anymore. So when you have these just well, it's shitty really easy to be a, a like, come you know on, a keyboard warrior and get on social media and all of that, uh, you know, but and, and try to say you want change, but to actually make change is difficult. And yeah. you know, this cat is in way over his head uh, to the point where we actually see the Air Force attack Harlem and drop bombs on it. Uh, but again, we'll get to that shortly. Why don't you play the clip and get everyone caught up, and then we'll move forward. What a bore. They just sit there and take bennies and stay up all night with their face stuck in a bunch of books and their thumb up their ass. Oh, yes, yes. I remember when the time when it was all very inspiring and enlightening, all this history and literature and sociology shit. You think learning is a really big thing and you become this big fucking intellectual and sit around trying to out-intellectual all the other big fucking intellectuals. You spend years and years with your nose buried in these goddamn tomes while the world is passing you by. All the stuff to see and all the kicks and all the girls are are out there and me, a writer and a poet who should be having adventures and experiencing all the diversities and paradoxes and ironies of life and passing over all the roads of the world and digging all the cities and towns and, and rivers and the oceans and making all of them chicks. Oh, God. As a writer and a poet, it is my duty to get out there and dig the world. To swing the whole friggin' scene while there is still time, man. My farting around days are over, baby. From this day on, I shall live every day as if it was my last. Yeah, yeah, I must do it. No more of the dreary, boring classes, the dismal lectures, the sitting around bullshitting with pretentious, fat-ass hippies. No more of the books, the spoutings of a bunch of old farts who think they know the whole goddamn score. <laughs> <laughs> God, what have I done? All right, so that kind of gives you um, something of an impression with regard to the position that the film takes with a lot of these matters. 
By the way, can I just mention something, Ryan? So before we continue, uh, there's a scene that happens shortly after that. Now, this is a 78-minute scene. Can you explain to me how the fuck you have a filler scene in a 78-minute movie? Now, this scene is actually kind of cool, but I'm specifically talking about the scene where it's the crow, and he's just bouncing along to that Bo Diddley song, which, by the way, great song. Love that song. Hadn't heard it before, and I've listened to it like 16 times in the last 72 hours on Spotify since. But that crow's just bouncing around to this Bo Diddley song, and it takes like... All two and a half minutes of this song for this, like, little tiny stamp-sized frame to just, like, slowly come toward you and expand. And it's like, really? You're going to have filler in a 78-minute <laughs> movie? Are you kidding me? Yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, shit took longer back then. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. It's we like, had a lot of long, drawn-out scenes of, like, rivers and stuff in Aguirre, you know? And, uh... Uh, you go back and you watch some of these old, and I, I think I brought that up last episode where it just, it'll never cease to amaze me how uh, you watch these, you know, newer films, obviously it's just, you know, uh, way faster editing styles. And, and back then they weren't afraid to just l do a slow zoom for an entire song to uh opening scene. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> like I said, I'm convinced they came in short, like, and he just had to do that. Could be. And then, and then, you know, all, actually on that note, like there's another scene that might kind of arguably qualify for that. It comes a little bit later, but I think it's my favorite film or I'm sorry, my favorite scene in the whole film. It's the scene where it's, I believe a Billie Holiday song is playing and it's just like, um, sort of, it starts a wide shot of a junkyard and then it kind of zooms in and we get these sort of tracking and panning shots and it's a bunch of sort of artifacts and relics and trash and garbage um, related to all of the soldiers, uh, the, specifically the black soldiers, crow soldiers that had come back from the war. Um, and I yep. thought that was actually a really powerful scene where, you know, it just shows everything from, you know, the, the photo album of the people that came back. You know, we see some broken bottles and some broken syringes. Um, you know, we see some of the guns and knives and razors, things like that. Um, I thought that was a really powerful scene. I also read that, uh, Bakshi bought the rights to a bill that Billy Holiday song for thirty five dollars. <laughs> uh, I don't know I how he that pulled too. that one yeah, off. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but um, but yeah, but I thought that was actually like a really powerful scene in the middle of you know the rest. It was heartfelt in a way that the rest of the film is not, and I appreciated that. But anyway, yeah, I mean. Yeah. Go I, on. yeah, I got nothing on this movie, man. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot. That he was maybe trying to say and failed. I don't know if he was trying to make statements and just came up short or uh, what. Because it's always just kind of right there. What I can tell you is this movie, uh, like I was saying before, I just feel like it served its purpose. That it pushed a lot of boundaries um, for other cinematic filmmakers. And that's, I guess, why I'm glad that we watched it and why it's on the list. A lot of films that you and I love... Uh, even movies like American Psycho or the Rob Zombie films, uh, you know, with with, uh, you know, this movie has a very pretty traumatic, violent end with a uh, uh, was it a rape scene? And yeah, with, uh, that cartoon was cartoon hippo or horse. Yeah. Uh, it's so, you know, but the, and then I was like, why? Why is this in here? And then I started to kind of think like, well, I mean. That's that it was in American Psycho, and you love that movie. Is it different because it's animated? So it, it kind of like has this weird conflicting thing in your head where it's supposed to be all cute and lovable, but now it's but yet you like South Park and you watched uh Indiana Jones get raped over a pinball machine by George Lucas <laughs> and Steven Spielberg, and that was funny. So, where it made me like question my own morals and ethics in a way that I don't know a lot of other movies have. Like, what's you know, I would be like, what's wrong with this movie? And then I'd have to really stop and think like, no, Ryan, what's wrong with you, buddy? You need a hug, dude. <laughs> well, I think it's because of like the, 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 the ultimate message at hand. Right. So like South Park, the episode you're, you're, you're speaking about is, is basically just a play on words about the Indiana Jones franchise being raped. And then they just take it to like a very literal sort of extreme. Right. But at the end of the day, it's about filmmakers not showing respect to a beloved franchise, right? Like you disrespected right, right. this property, so now we're going to disrespect you, right? And I think but that my that point is, is those very... things couldn't exist without this thing. 
Sure, but I also think that it's very different. It's basically like, I'm not going to punch you until, you know, I'm, but I will punch back if you attack me type of thing, right? Like, the messaging in this film, there is so much no means yes in this movie. Like, way more oh, than yeah, even, definitely. like, Straw Dogs and Sam Peckinpah films. Like, basically the message right. is, if you fondle women long enough, they will give in to theirs and your baser temptations and, and bang oh, no, you. No, and, and that was very, very disturbing. Like, so, like, every single woman, it's like... Fritz goes to fondle her and she's like, oh, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden she's like way super into it. And it's like it feels like it's just a at worst, like juvenile fantasy. Like, I don't know that Bach, she's like, you don't get the sense that he's encouraging, you know, sexual assault by any means. I think it's just this very sort of like old school, like early James Bond kind of approach to, you know, relationships with women and what's acceptable. But no, no. I mean, I wrote here in my notes, Jason, I. Uh, I wrote down, this must have been Donald Trump's Saturday morning cartoon that he watched. <laughs> it's very much in that vein. Like, it's just yeah. a no means yes. At, you said it best. I, and it was very disturbing on a cartoon level. It was disturbing to watch. Yeah, for um, sure. And, and so the film You would takes... think that would have softened the blow and it had somehow made it worse. <laughs> I yeah, don't know. Man. So at the, uh, at your, as you said, though, towards the end, the film kind of takes, I mean, a hard right for this film, but you get this sort of scene where all of a sudden um, Fritz is trying to basically hook up with this large crow that's basically, you know, representative of a black woman. And again, you know, there's sort of a lot of stereotypes at play there, but of course, because by the way, she was played, her name is Bertha in the, in the film. And she was played by uh, Rosetta Lenoir who played the grandma from family matters with Steve Urkel and the whole bit. Wow, that's crazy. I had no idea. Um, this is her breakout role, so <laughs> thanks. But And then, of course, because <laughs> it's this type of movie, like, they've, yes, of course there are going to be a scene where when Fritz finally does, you know, seal the deal and it's time to, you know, for him to get down with her, like, there's going to be a joke about his tiny penis and how it's not enough for her, right? Like, because of course there is, because... It's just so much of this humor, maybe it wasn't on the nose at the time. I mean, we're looking at this film through the lens of history. Maybe it's easy to take for granted a lot of these things, but like, this is all humor that's been done before right now. So whether or not these types of things were being done before, whether in animation, whether on stage in stand-up comedy, you know, maybe this is sort of tied into that whole sort of Lenny Bruce era uh, where everyone, that's where everyone started sort of rebelling against censorship. But again, it just felt like it was doing it for the sake of doing it. I actually have a, another clip that I'm going to play here of the scene where he does. So after that, he actually ends up starting a race riot. Uh, he goes down and he's talking about how everyone needs to sort of revolt and rebel when he sort of spent the whole time talking about how these revolutionaries are sort of to be detested and looked down upon. Um, so I guess the point is that he kind of ends up becoming what he's rallied against for so long. Either way... Let's go ahead and listen to this, and uh, again, it'll sort of give you an idea of where the film is ending at. Revolt! Revolt! Revolt, you thick-skulled idiots! You have carried heavy burdens for the bosses! You have sweat your lives away for the bosses! The bosses! They ride around in limousines! Get the fuck off my the bosses, car! they're eating strawberries and cream! <laughs> that funny cat's a real boss! All right, what's going on here? Break it up! Cool it, officer. You're just blowing hot air. No one's paying no mind. Come to revolution, there are going to be no more limousines. Come to revolution, there are going to be no more strawberries and cream, see? <laughs> hey, Ralph, you know how these dumb kids are. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah, fucking A, right. There he is! He's the one who keeps the bosses in power! He's the one who's holding you down! Who, me? You! No, no, not me, you! No, you! Not me, you! You, you, you! Me? Not me! Yeah, you! You! Fuck you! Yo, face! The spiked boot of capitalism! The iron thumb on the heads of the proletariat! All right, now, Ryan, so for a film that's banana pants crazy, we're gonna move forward to where this film goes next. And this just was like, in a movie full of what-the-hell moments, 
it may have been the ultimate because all of a sudden out of nowhere Fritz is like wandering down the highway some random chick picks him up which I had no idea through the course of the film ended up it was supposed to be his girlfriend and I was like first of all who the hell is this girl that just randomly picks him up and from there what the hell is this Nazi heroin addicted rabbit and where did he come from and why is he a thing that just came out of nowhere we're just kind of like on this weird trip with this uh, cat going through all these different worlds, like I said before. And uh, also, like I said before, Jason, I'm really sorry I made you watch this. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to sit here. Dude, I'm really, look, I'm really trying hard to be a good sport and uh, dissect this film. Um, it, it turned my stomach. It made me uncomfortable at times. I'm certain that was its point and, and its intended purpose, but uh, maybe not in the ways that it did. Uh, also, again, we are looking at this through the lens of history, like you said. We know things uh, now that we maybe didn't, that we were just starting to become uh, confronted with back then. We have the benefit of being able to see clearly now, or hopefully see clearly now. Um, uh, dude, I don't have any explanation for any of this <laughs> shit. And it always seems to top itself, because we start off at college at NYU, and he's getting high, and he's in the bathtub with an orgy, and there's like cartoon nudity everywhere. And it's like, crazy cartoon nudity and all of a sudden and like you're like oh wow and then all of a sudden we uh go into harlem and we start dealing with like racism and race issues and and uh systematic stuff and all of that and it's like oh okay wow and then all of a sudden the air force is dropping bombs and uh the the military is against its own people and oh wow and now all of a sudden there's a nazi rabbit doing heroin and then we go to a cult leader's house and there's rape and it's like jesus christ uh, like in the beginning, my notes were like, oh, wow, the the pig cop, the cops are uh, played by pigs and they're chasing him throughout his adventure. That's kind of the, the ticking clock or the catalyst that pushes him forward. He's trying to escape the police. Sure. The cops are played by pigs. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're in the uh, did you notice that when he's uh, when, when we're confronting the, the rabbis, we're in the um, in temple. Uh, one of the pigs said, these are my people. Don't hurt them. It's a pig. <laughs> Uh, a Jewish pig they can't eat por- like oh my god like you know there's a lot going on here and I thought like wow that's kind of you know, okay I have a Jewish pig and then all of a sudden uh, by the end of the film I was like that was nothing uh, I'm not going to defend this I have no comment I'm going to plead the fifth on most of this stuff I'll, I'll tell you you know uh, I'll answer your questions but but there's you know very little more I have to say about this film other, other than uh it's 118 minutes, everyone, and it's free on Amazon Prime, so enjoy. <laughs> it's it's actually 78 minutes, dude, uh, so you get to save half an hour off your time. Um, but uh, I said I said it's an hour and 18 minutes. Didn't oh, I say an hour and 18 minutes? Sorry. Sorry. I'll go back to my corner now. You're, you're on the metric system. You're doing the metric system <laughs> time. That's fine. Okay, 78 so... 78 minutes. 78 do- minutes, everybody. <laughs> Let's go ahead and wrap this up. So it, it, it ends where, so I guess the whole point of this rabbit is to introduce him as a revolutionary that ultimately recruits Fritz and his girlfriend to blow up a power station because, again, they're part of some sort of bullshit lizard Illuminati revolutionary meeting or something. I don't know. It was It was way weird. And for some reason, out of nowhere, they decide to sexually assault and gang rape this heroin addicted rabbit's girlfriend like it comes so out of nowhere and to your point you mentioned earlier like why was that in there like whatever you have have to say about that south park moment and it being inappropriate like you can at least understand why it's there this was just right right i didn't i did i don't know what i was supposed to i guess we're just maybe because we're supposed to dislike the revolutionaries maybe it was kind of another like again this is a film that largely pokes fun at a lot of, you know, leftist and liberalism and extreme leftist leftist and liberalism looks like sort of revolutionary counterculture. So maybe it was just more digs on that subculture. But either way, it was definitely gross and uncomfortable. Um, after that, I like my I like my gang rape with a message. That's what we're saying here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then here's the most here's the most upsetting There goes my presidential almost. bid one day. <laughs> that, that is that that is recorded for history, man. That's not going anywhere. That's the soundbite. Yeah, that's the soundbite. I hope that's on the back of a book someday. In quotations. What's it's gonna be? Your, it's gonna be the it. central quote of your biography, bro. 
Um, but yeah, if you're gonna gang rape a, uh, an animated character, make at least let me learn something from it. You know, and, give me that, give me something to take home, give me a little nugget of uh, wisdom. Little, <laughs> you know, and this is what's upsetting from there too. Is so he does end up having like a change of heart when he's actually sitting there and like the dynamite's already been lit and lit because they're gonna blow up the power station, and th- and I don't understand what it was that made him have the change of heart. I do know. That it wasn't the gang rape. So what kind of morals do you have, Fritz? I don't <laughs> care that you all of a sudden decided like, oh, maybe I should blow up the power plant because the gang rape right. did nothing for you. So you're a horrible right, person. Right. I don't care that you made this hard right to try to salvage yourself. You're gross. You're hedonistic. And he just doubles down on that with the ending. So I actually have... A clip, it'll be the last clip that we play from this film of the very last scene where Fritz seemingly has a moment of vulnerability, but of course, because of the nature of his character, it's revealed his true nature at the end, and he's just gross and manipulative. Let's listen to the very last lines of dialogue in Fritz the Cat. He's trying to say something. been up and down the four corners of this big old world. I've seen it all and, and I've, I've done it all. I've fought many a good man. I've laid many a good woman. And if there's one thing I've learned. It's, 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 you get over here, and you get down there like that, and now you blonde, you get under here. Like that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So what I will say is that's a very appropriate ending to this film, but I don't mean that as a compliment. Is uh yeah, like I said, it's a it's a film of questionable morals, and if you're one of those people where you just like films that push buttons because you think that button pushing is the statement in and of itself, you may like this film. Personally, I don't really get behind that. You know, I want there to be more pointed criticism. I want there to uh, be elements of the film that examines what's going on. I don't want it to be the cinematic equivalent of a shitty teenager that just craps all over everything because they're overprivileged. Right. And that's what this It really film did is. feel like that. Yeah. No, so, I got no defense of this. I, I, <laughs> I mean, in hindsight, I don't know. So let me ask you this, uh, it, it, and we'll kind of you know start to wrap things up and move towards uh, uh, Swiss Army Man, which I'm really looking forward to talking about with you. Yeah. Um, but in hindsight... Okay. Uh, knowing now what you what you know about this film, would you have kept it on the list uh, for us to watch, or do you regret ever seeing it? Like, <laughs> or do you think it's just a wasted movie? W- how no. do you feel about those 118 minutes of your life? <laughs> uh, okay, 78 so- minutes. Excuse me, 78 minutes metric. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I said at the top of the show, man. <clears throat> I'm glad to have watched it. I am. It's a film. I want to have seen once so that I can be part of the discussion. I don't think it is a film that has much to offer in today's society. But, you know, it's kind of one of those... It comes from the same place of not wanting to glorify history and look at it through rose-colored glasses, right? Like, history for everybody and every nation and every culture has really bright moments and some really gross moments and to pretend like those negative moments didn't happen i think works against us you know sort of that whole concept of doomed to repeat history if we don't learn from it and acknowledge it so i'm never gonna say like oh this film shouldn't exist this film should be banned like this film no absolutely not this film is important relative to its place in cinematic history it just so happens it's a really bad film that i do not recommend anybody watches more than once but at the same time assuming look 
This is a movie for film buffs to have seen. Like, I'm never going to suggest that my wife, who's not the same sort of film buff that I am, right? She's more of a casual viewer. She doesn't need to see this film, right? But for you and I that went to film school, we consider ourselves film buffs. We like acting as historians of cinema and having that knowledge and being able to have these discussions. I'm glad we watched it. Don't regret putting it on the list, but it's never going to be a film that I go back and rewatch. Yeah, I don't know if I would call myself a historian of cinema. I uh, I would say I'm I, same. Th- I, I'm glad I saw this. Uh, I'm glad it broke a lot of those boundaries. Uh, if if th- these things were needed to be said at that time in this way, I don't under you know I don't I didn't live in that time, uh, so I don't know. Um, obviously, 1971 when this was probably being made is a very polarizing time in this country uh, during the uh, you know. Vietnam War and, and you know, Nixon and, and Johnson and all this stuff that was going on at the time, uh, civil rights and, and everything. Uh, so, look, I mean, there, there was a lot to say. And uh, he had an animated format with which to say it. And he chose to really push some boundaries, boundaries that allowed us to have things uh, that we take for granted today in our uh, current animated world. But, uh, yeah, as far as a standalone film, isolated uh, in a situation, watch this, lock the door, don't tell anyone uh, you saw it, and just enjoy it for what it is. This is, and I stand by this, uh, this is the two live crew of animated films. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's not that great, but it needed to exist so that other things could exist. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, we're actually going to finish with... And uh, also on our list is, uh, also on our list down the road, I hope to get to, uh, just a little a little uh, n- uh, nugget uh, for uh, our listeners, I hope uh, to get to Lord of the Rings, also by Bakshi. I am really curious to see how that plays out, knowing <laughs> what, how fucked up Bakshi is. <laughs> and having gotten our Peter Jackson uh, Lord of the Rings version and seeing how, you know, epic and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, you know, am I going to go? I've never seen uh, the Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, I I'm hoping either. for Hobbit tits. <laughs> I think we're going to be disappointed, dude, because I checked it out and it's a straight PG. Like, it's not even like a PG-13, okay. dude. It's a straight PG. Um, Someone ring this guy back in. Got yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, anyway, so. Well, we're that's gonna, interesting in and of itself, but. Yeah, we're going to finish up with a new sort of little mini feature. Um, at the end of each film discussion, we're going to summarize what we thought about the film by mentioning three adjectives that we think best describe this film. So, Ryan, why don't you tell me what three adjectives you have that best describe your experience with Fritz the Cat? Uh, yeah, I mean, I got selfish, chaotic, and relevant, question (laughs) mark? I like the question mark, yeah. Uh, So I think for me, the three adjectives that best uh, sum up this film... Ill moraled, cynical, bad fucking movie. So that pretty yeah, much. I describes just uh, it. I I wasn't sure if horseshit was a was an adjective <laughs> or a noun. Oh so. yeah, no, dude, you can get creative with these for sure. Like I said, throw in some ad. Yeah, I wrote horseshit know, and then I scribbled it out. No, no, dude, no, no, you gotta <laughs> lean into that, man. I'm, 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 we were right there, dude. You should have gone with horseshit. So I'll allow you to sort All of, right. uh, you know, everybody who's listening, just uh, his third. Option, scrub that out, replace with horse shit. And we will be back after the I guess the that can't be an adjective. That was a horse shit movie. Like, that's a descriptive <laughs> thing of... We will be back after the break to discuss Swiss Army Man. Hang around with us. Aberrant Literature is proud to present the next great anthology in modern fiction. Aberrant Tales, edited by Jason Peters. Most anthologies are content to sit in one lane offering bland, repetitive versions of the same types of stories. Aberrant Tales is different. Aberrant literature turns the anthology on its head by blending together multiple genres within the realms of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. With Aberrant Tales, no two stories are ever the same. In one story, you're being transported to a faraway future where corporations allow access to visions of your future, while in the next, you're taken to a distant land of dark fantasy featuring errant knights and grotesque monstrosities. Aberrant Tales is a unique collection of short fiction for those who are tired of the same old thing. It's unapologetically creative, wonderfully imaginative, and embraces its own unique spirit. Find Aberrant Tales today in ebook, 
hardcover and paperback versions. Online and everywhere books are sold. Published by Aberrant Literature. Okay, buddy? Okay, buddy. You're a miracle. Or I'm just hallucinating from starvation. You're special. I'm special. There's seven billion people on the planet. You might be lucky enough to bump into the one person you want to spend the rest of your life with. Oh my God. So this is the life I've forgotten. This is just the beginning. That was the trailer for the second film of our discussion, which is Swiss Army Man. And uh, this was a really interesting one. It's a film with a banana pants crazy description and uh, really enjoyed it. Ryan, why don't you tell us a little bit about this film first? <laughs> I love this movie. Uh <laughs> Yeah, Fandango describes this outrageously fun and deeply affecting Swiss Army Man as a gonzo buddy comedy that is the feature film debut of acclaimed music video directors Daniel Scheinert and Daniel Kwan, collectively known as the Daniels. Uh, responsible for visionary Turn Down for What video, amongst many others. Uh, Turn Down for What by Little John. Bursting with limited creativity, uh, limitless creativity in both form and content, Swiss Army Man goes from the absurd to the emotional to the whimsical to the profound and back again. And boy, does it ever. Uh, we talk. We pick up with Hank, and it's, uh, he's stranded on a desert island, having given up all hope of ever making it home again. But one day, everything changes when a corpse named Manny, played by Daniel Radcliffe, washes up on shore. The two become best friends and ultimately go on this epic adventure. This is... Uh, you know, cast away um, on on acid. This is bananas. <laughs> I loved it. This is your first time seeing it. I had seen this once before uh, when it first came out mm. to watch um, way back in 2016. Uh, Jay, what'd you think, Jason? Okay, so I loved this film. I thought it was really, really good. Um, there are there's there's one aspect of the film in particular that I took issue with, specifically the screenplay, which we'll get into over the course of this discussion. Everything else about it was uh, me too. Pretty... So I'm curious if it's the same issue. Yeah, everything else about it was pretty flawless. Um, wonderful direction, wonderful acting, cinematography, sound design was great. Film, uh, the score was great. Everything about it was really, really good, but there were some story issues. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, when this film starts. We get a great opening shot of the ocean and we see this trash that's kind of just sort of floating through it. And there's a juice box and I think it's scrawled with the message, I don't want to die alone. And so we, you know, very quickly see Hank, who's our protagonist, played by Paul Dano. And he's introduced with a rope around his neck and he's about to hang himself on this desert island. And, you know, he's balancing pre pre precariously on like a cooler or something like that. And then all of a sudden he sees this body wash ashore, which is, you know, the character Manny played by Daniel Radcliffe. And so he obviously is intrigued, but he's still going to go through with it. And then all of a sudden Daniel Radcliffe's body just lets out a massive fart. And this would be the first of many, many farts over the course of this movie. <laughs> it's actually funny that it's like it's not really a juvenile movie with regard to the tone that it takes uh, but it's got more farting than any Mel Brooks films ever had. So it kind of strikes a unique tone throughout it. Um, 
The, I guess uh, Paul Dano said that the pitch from the Daniels uh, to get him on board uh, s- stated that he, they wanted to make uh, you laugh with the first fart and cry with the last fart. <laughs> and Paul Dano said, I'm in. That's true. <laughs> that's yeah, that's pretty fantastic. Yeah. So um, so needless to say, he ends up deciding not to hang himself trips. There's, you know, a scene, a moment where he almost does, but he gets out. And so he runs over to the body and (laughs) the farts still continue to the point that his body starts like maneuvering through the water. And then we basically get what I can only describe as a free willy moment where Hank jumps on top of he's riding. He's riding. uh, He's riding him like a jet ski, you know, basically the farts to propel propel him across the open sea. Naturally, duh. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> what else would you do? <laughs> right. So it was funny because I actually read that, like, so, so this film premiered at Sundance, and when it did, like, there were some people that just found the premise of that so ridiculous that they just immediately walked out. But then the people that stuck around, like, I'm sure it ended up getting a standing ovation or something. So this is a movie where it is going to kind of test your tolerance for setup and premise and. I do understand that there's probably people that are going to think that it's just too absurd to be able to take seriously. And at least the film lets you know what you're getting right off the bat, right? Like Right off the bat. It doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, you know, this is a film kind of akin to a lot of movies that were coming out around that era, like Kings of Summer or Hunt for the Wilder People yeah, or uh-huh. Where the Wild Things Are, where you take your main characters and you put them in a completely surreal environment to make a statement. Uh, the acting is genuine. The relationships between your characters are genuine. It's just really their surroundings or their predicaments or, you know, the the it's it's kind of like a... It's got some Looney Tunes rules to it, you know, and but it, as long as you set the rules up that way to begin your film, I think that you're OK. It's not like it just cuts to that uh, farting jet ski, you know, a half hour into the film or an hour into the film, uh, in which case, you know, you're kind of like, wait, what? But it, 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 it sets the tone. It sets the rules right up front and it plays by those rules throughout. Uh, all the way up to the end, actually, the the bitter end. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's also not a very long movie. Uh, these Both no. these films that we're reviewing were really palatable. Um, Fritz seemed like a two-hour film, even though it was <laughs> 78 minutes. But uh, metric. But um, Swiss Army <laughs> Man was an, about an hour and a half, and it gets through it pretty quick. It doesn't really drag on at time, uh, at any moment. Like, everything kind of feels like it's necessary. It's a very well-edited film, I felt like. Yeah, yeah. So it's it makes a lot of sense that this film was written and directed. Well, I don't think it was written, but it was at least directed by uh, the Danielses, who were music video directors previously, as you mentioned. So yeah, they wrote it too. Oh, they, oh, they did. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, because obviously one of the things about this film, and really like the the one thing that I think this film does better than anything else, is that marriage of music and visuals, which I think you actually mentioned that last week, like you were a big fan of music videos because of its ability to sort of call atmosphere and set tone and mood and all of these very cool things um, without the constraints of, you know, traditional storytelling. So the film does that really, really well. And I think that's also part of sort of letting you know what it is right off the bat, because that opening scene, again, you know, for whatever narrative qualities may be missing, like it's really ultimately a, wonderful marriage of visuals and audio. Um, and you know, that's really what this film has to offer. So very shortly after that, we see that they have arrived at a, you know, new quote unquote Island, if you will. And, uh, we get this great shot of the beach where we see like the footprints and it sort of tracks forward, sort of floating across the sands. And then, uh, the footprints and the tracks, we, you know, we see, uh, Hank rolling Manny's body across the ocean, And this is sort of, again, something that we're going to see a lot. These really wonderful shots, picturesque shots, sweeping shots, really well lit, really gorgeously photographed. Again, that music video sensibility coming through where everything looks great. Um, And, you know, the scene that kind of follows that later on at night where they're in the cave, um, that was a, a gorgeously filmed sequence. So it actually starts with something of a... If it's not a wide shot, it's probably a medium wide shot from inside the cave. You've got this really cool blue lighting and then you sort of see 
in the background you get this uh you know the the setting outside and the camera very slowly like pushes in and and uh into probably a close-up or like at least a two shot of the two of them lying down and hank's talking to manny and then you know from there we get the reveal where manny's sort of this like human canteen of sorts he collects like the runoff water in his mouth and when hank pushes his chest the water like gushes out which was funny and it also the way in which it sort of projectile vomits reminded me very much of the scene from team america where he vomits all over everything <laughs> and it's just like you can tell it's just like some crude tube that just like is just blasting water and they don't even try to hide that um so that was yeah, funny. i mean this this whole movie kind of plays out like a two-man play almost like, like a stage play to me and it, uh when they get in that cave uh, to me, it was almost reminiscent of a uh, proscenium view of a stage, like you're in the audience looking at a uh, proscenium. Uh, mm. and, and it's just a two-man deal. It's just uh, Daniel Radcliffe and Paul Dano playing the whole thing out pretty much until the very, very end uh, with a little bit of um, Mary Elizabeth Winstead peppered in there um, as a uh, female love interest for these characters. And uh, but it's, you know, all done through a cell phone and, and photography for the most part. Uh, this is a film about loneliness. This is a film about isolation. Mm -hmm. This is kind of told on the heels of social media takeover with Facebook and so forth. Um, you know, 2016. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's that long ago, but, you know, the iPhone hasn't been around that long. Social media hasn't been around that long. These are all things we just kind of take for granted as an everyday part of life. But I kind of feel like 2016 might have been a fever pitch of the results of that, where we as a society were kind of looking at uh, some of the results of the seeds we had, you know, sown in ways of, uh, in, in, in exchange for convenience, we've given up human contact. And uh, this film kind of had a lot to say about that, I feel like. Um, this is, Paul Dano is, is stranded on an island, rides uh, Daniel uh, Radcliffe, um, across to a beach uh he's feel like he feels like he's escaped uh, great i'm back to the mainland i you know you help me and he's like now you're my friend and he drags him to this uh cave until he can't drag him anymore they look they seek for shelter and uh and he's also finding trash bags along the way uh within the woods that uh different bags of trash and things that they're surviving on uh and then as they get stationed there uh he befriends uh this dead body this corpse manny uh Dan played by daniel radcliffe and and uh and they they create a bond uh, daniel starts to come alive uh whether it's in uh paul dano's head or in reality it's kind of left up to the viewer mm -hmm. uh, i believe unless there's something i missed um but uh yeah it's just this kind of weird world where they bond and help each other daniel radcliffe more or less acts as a uh, his character manny acts as like a sounding board uh for uh, Hank, uh, Paul Nano's character, Hank Tompkins. That, so, by the way, that's a little spin. Uh, Hank Tompkins is a little spin on Tom Hanks, uh, who played uh -oh. the character in Castaway. So it's a little oh, that's funny. Uh, I wink and a that. nod to uh, to Castaway. But yeah, he uh, kind of just helps him talk things through like a therapist would. Um, you know, uh, realizing where his uh, how his life took him here, how he got to this point until the very end. There's a moment, uh, I guess, for redemption, maybe, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I did That's find it interesting. I like, I, I was actually surprised when he started talking. Like, I actually for the first half hour or so or 20 minutes, however long it takes. Like, I, I legitimately thought that Daniel Radcliffe was just going to stay mute for the entire course of the movie um, and just basically play like some sort of like, I don't know, giant doll or something like that. Um, so I didn't know that he starts talking. I did find that le moment legitimately surprising, um, right after that, that water moment. And yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of the themes, like, and it's interesting because the way that the film develops, you've got an interesting juxtaposition between the reality of the situation, which is, you know, again, discussing spoilers here that Hank's ultimately insane, that this is all sort of a figment of his imagination. Like you say, maybe there's some element of discussion because of the final scene. But I think for the most part, like we at least there's no question that the worlds that he's created um, end up being a figment of his imagination. You know, the, the, that he's sort of built with the trash behind her house and but at the same time so within these moments it's interesting because on the one hand it's like okay well this guy is kind of deranged psychotic psychopathic whatever you want to say like 
uh, you know, we after the reveal at the end, we realize like, yeah, okay, this guy needs to be hospitalized, etc. But during the film, before we know that, <clears throat> he's using these opportunities to explore the theme that ultimately it's these very small moments in life, as well as the connections that we make with people along the way that are that are to be celebrated. And so there's actually like a great montage earlier on um, where he's sort of explaining what life is, you know, and he's just talking about all of the very sort of small things that we take for granted that compose, uh, you know, just again, like a normal everyday life and how much they sort of appreciate those basic things. And then that's sort of echoed later in the bus scene, which I thought was a really powerful scene as well, um, where, you know, he ends up simulating what a bus is for Manny and Manny's got his head against, you know, what is ostensibly the window of the bus. And Hank has made this sort of, you know, canvas thing that simulates the images of the outside world passing by the windows. And we get this wonderful right. cinematography and this wonderful sound. And there's a very sort of cute, innocent moment where Manny says, wow, this is taking the bus. Like when we get home, I'm going to take the bus every day of my life. Right. <laughs> and so it's it's this constant reinforced theme that we see of this things that we would take for granted these moments in life that we would take for granted riding the bus saying hello to someone um you know that these become moments of magic for manny as he is introduced to them as concepts and hank as well is clearly in fascination of these moments as he's describing them um we and and actually i do have a clip of that of that bus montage scene that i'm going to go ahead and play for um, our listeners real quick so this will sort of give you a sense of the tone and the atmosphere in which this film operates so that you get a sense of sort of like the uh, the emotional quality that it's going for so let's take a listen here as you listen you stare out the window uh, and i watch the world go by So this is it. This is the life I've forgotten. Oh, when I get back home, I'm gonna ride the bus every day. Manny, this is just the beginning. Every day you ride the bus and count the minutes hoping you'll see her again. Oh my God. to ride the bus alone. I don't want this to stop. It's not working? No. She's too beautiful. I can't talk to her now. What if I say something stupid? I just want to die. She's right there. You're not going to do anything? Well, what would you do? I would... I would probably wait and watch her get off the bus and go home and eat a whole box of pizza by myself. Now, obviously you guys can't see the images associated with what you're hearing, but the images really are very arresting. It's very elegantly shot. You know, the editing, um, everything's composed very it's well. It's very Spike sequences. Jones. It's very Michel Gondry. Uh, you know, you get these auteur director, uh, music video directors that uh, a lot of us grew up loving. Um, you know, and then they get into filmmaking and you get stuff like this. Spike Jones, very much the same. Michel Gondry, very much the same. I, uh, I kind of hearkened a lot of this Woods stuff uh, to Michel Gondry's Be Kind Rewind with Jack Black. And sure. uh, they have a point where they recreate a whole lot of old classic VHS 
uh, legendary scenes like mm-hmm. Ghostbusters or yeah, King yeah, Kong yeah. or some of these things. And they do it with miniatures and things that they found around the alleyway. And it's just amazing. Like, <laughs> Google that one scene from Be Kind Rewind, and it's just such a cool uh, montage to put to music. And, uh, and you know, they do a lot of that similar stuff here. The music, by the way, is... Um, done by the guys from Manchester Orchestra, who the Daniels had done music videos for in the past as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've worked with bands like Phoenix. Uh, but the the uh, soundtrack is mostly a cappella and mood music. There's very little, if any, lyrics or anything poppy. Uh, it's just kind of mellow and chill and kind of lets you, it sets the background tone. Uh, there's even some points where uh, you kind of break the wall a little bit and, and uh, the characters sing along with the music or they yeah. start a song and then it carries on into the soundtrack. So it becomes kind of one with the plot and with the actors. Uh, the music almost plays a character in the film. But sure. uh, yeah, you got Manny, you got uh, Daniel Radcliffe who mir- miraculously comes back to life in the cave and he has lost his memory. He doesn't remember why he's there or how he got there. And basically, uh, Hank, our main character who tried killing himself. The onus is now on him to try to jog his memory, his newfound friend. He's trying to give him a reason to uh, want to live. And in doing so, he's almost kind of talking himself into that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we kind of see this journey of him teaching Daniel Radcliffe lessons of love. uh, And that's all done through an image that Radcliffe sees on uh, Hank's cell phone. Um, uh, Hank has had his cell phone with like 4% battery. He's kept it off. And every now and then you see him turn it on to look for a signal to search for help. Again, we've seen him this whole time as a stranded, uh, castaway of sorts. Mm -hmm. Um, and then as we start to learn more, the photo, he has a photo of a woman, uh, uh, played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead on his home screen. Uh, and Radcliffe asked him, who is that? And we start to see that who that actually is play out for the rest of the film. This kind of picks up act two and carries us in through the end of the film yes. where more and more is revealed about this woman who, uh, who Hank is uh, seen on a bus and never had the courage to talk to. And it's this moment that he uh, has clung to um, this entire time of lost love, missed opportunities. Like you said, the small moments and that's that scene we just listened to is uh, Hank has committed himself to recreating that moment on a bus Mm -hmm. uh, for Manny um, so that he could kind of learn from that. And uh, Manny believes that this woman, that the cell phone is his and mm-hmm. that this woman is his lost love. And so he's seeing it through uh, Hank's eyes, more or less. And, and uh, Hank gets to create all these little moments for, for Manny to try to jog his memory or uh, find a reason to live. And, and they talk about such weird minutia of life, like masturbation yeah. and how it's connected to uh, this weird scarring moment in Hank's childhood where mm-hmm. his, uh, with his mom and all this stuff. And uh, we find out his mom has passed away and... Um, it kind of like one sad moment after the other is revealed about Hank's life through him talking to Manny and the conversations they have one on one. Um, but it's done in such a, a humorous, light, lively way, even though it's, you know, really conquering all this really dark uh, content, you know, uh, yeah. really kind of this weird ju- juxtaposition of mood and, and uh you're never really sure whether to laugh or not, uh, but damn it, if Daniel Radcliffe isn't so damn charming in this film, <laughs> it just makes you want to laugh at all of it. Yeah, well, you know, and that sets up our next sort of topic of discussion here that I want to get into, um, which, you know, again, we both referenced earlier having some issues with the screenplay. I think uh, largely it starts in the second act and continues through the third. The first act is probably the strongest, the setup. Uh, real quick, a couple of funny, just sort of quick little observations that I picked up on that I wanted to notice. Uh, the first one is I love, I think they do it twice. They incorporate the phrase multi-purpose tool guy into the film yep. where he says, you're some sort of like multi-purpose tool guy, which generally speaking, there's the, always that one moment where like the main character or supporting character says the title of the film. So I just love the fact that, you know, being called Swiss army man, they just sort of turn that on its head. Very funny little moment. Yep. 
Um, the other I almost one, wondered if they did, if they weren't sure if they could get the rights to the to the name because of the knife or something. Like maybe that was <laughs> trademarked, and they're like, they're like well, just, just in case, case. same multi purpose tool guy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, the second is there's a scene is it's a very sort of brief where Paul Dano is like looking for berries and he ends up like eating berries and throwing them up. And just as a Simpsons fan, like immediately in my head, I went, it tastes like burning. So that has like (laughs) nothing to do with anything other than that reminded me of the Simpsons. And anytime you make me remember the Simpsons, it's going to be a positive. So uh, (laughs) let's go ahead and let's discuss the issues with the screenplay. So, Shortly after the moment that you've talked about, basically they set up that in essence, this is going to be a movie where the MacGuffin is they need to escape this wilderness. Right. Um, And so it's basically just the second act is sort of just them wandering through the forest and having these different moments. Um, And that's really about it. There's not a ton of story developments. There are some character developments, but unlike kind of what you were saying earlier, I actually thought the film resisted going into some of the more darker moments of Hank. I thought that the relationship with his father was really undercooked. And we'll get to that more in a minute. Uh, The one thing that I wanted to say is I do actually have a clip of this. So the device that they use to help them get out of the forest is that Manny uh, gets erections that are spurned on by a Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition that they find in the forest. (laughs) And these erections are essentially acting as a compass and guiding them forward through the forest. So I actually have a clip of this. And what they do nicely here in this clip is instead of just introducing, you know, the erection as compass device, they do allow some of Hank's character to come through where he's talking about how he sort of comes up with these different stories um, for the different Sports Illustrated swimsuits. And they're these very sort of tender, you know, relationship-based things. They're not, um, you know, crude or rude or anything like that. And this is sort of something, again, talking about that juxtaposition, juxtaposition, like, it's funny that this film is very sweet and very tender and also has a ton of dick and fart jokes. And like normally dick yeah. and fart jokes like show up in Kevin Smith movies where, you know, they're very cynical or they're rude, they're crude, whatever. So like to have that many dick and fart jokes in such an ultimately sweet and tender film, despite where it ends up in the third act, like that's a very unique balancing act. I don't know that a lot of people could pull it off. So it's kind of one of those things where like kudos just to the fact that it exists, even whether you like it or not. But let's go ahead and let's listen to that scene real quick here so you guys can uh, know what we're talking about. Before the internet, every girl was a lot more special. Oh, I bet you probably did the same thing. Make up little love stories for each of them. All kinds of love stories. Well, her name might have been Jesse. And you'd imagine bumping into her on the street and whisking her off her feet, sign a one-year lease together, cook dinner together, watch Netflix. Hey, something's, something's going wrong with my boobs. What do you mean? They're going crazy. Holy shit. Oh, oh no, it's stopping. Hey. What is Netflix? Shit. Uh, no. Well, that's normally when you go on a date. The girl, you'd take her to the theater to watch a movie. But when you're when you're truly comfortable with someone, you stay at home and watch Netflix. Like you and Jesse, you probably stayed at home together all the time watching movies. You'd, you'd fall asleep on the couch unless you were throwing one of your awesome parties. And, mm-hmm. and a few years later, you'd you'd get married. You'd have a, a small wedding, nothing big, and and you'd have twins, and and you'd have to get a second job to pay the bills. But you wouldn't care because. Because you'd be going camping all the time with your family and, and, and you'd tell her she looks even more beautiful with gray hairs, Manny. Manny, I think my love story is bringing you back to life. Oh! 
Whoa! Whoa! It's moving! What's happening? Oh! What is that? It's still alive! What is it? It's moving! Oh, God, I'm disgusted. No, 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 no. you're not disgusting. Oh, no, my body is disgusting. No, it's no. horrible. It's okay. This happens to everybody. This happens to everybody. It's normal. Really? Yeah. Okay. So that is a great scene, and I think that it, you know, achieves what this film does well. Let me tell you, so, let me ask you, Ryan, so earlier, or later in the film, I forget where it is, but do you remember that moment where Hank is talking to Manny, and Manny's just starting to talk, and he's kind of struggling a little bit, and then Hank has that moment where he gets really frustrated, and he tells him to stop, quote, talking like a retard, and then he, like, very yes. quickly apologizes, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, that's that's my dad coming out, right? Like, there's right. this notion, there's this introduction that the father really screwed him up, but I thought that the film kind of left that unexplored, and I was wondering if you felt the same, or if you thought that yes. those few moments did The dad is my least enough. favorite part of this film. Um, you know, a lot of this film is, I think, open for interpretation and the conclusion. Um, I think that we need to finish talking about the plot and then kind of... Uh, I had a hard time taking notes on this film because I kind of had to just let it roll and then I could go back and look at it at its entirety because any single part of this film isn't really that important. It's the whole through line of the film from sure. and all three acts together that make it a movie. Other than that, they're just really cool scenes and, and really neat little moments. And, and I think that leans a lot on um, both them being filmmaker or uh, music video filmmakers previously, but also uh, kudos to them for pulling this off. This could have been a terrible movie. Sure. Um, yeah. I could have very, 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 <laughs> it could have been some Lloyd Kaufman this stuff. movie. This and it's led. Uh, it's it's um, you know props to to the actors, to the music. It's everything. It's just sure. such a good piece as a whole that uh, it's more about that than than any bit of the sum of its parts. So to sit there and like break it down scene by scene, or this didn't work, or that didn't work, was I found that really difficult to take notes on. It was just let's watch it. And then let's digest it and then write notes about what you liked or didn't like about it. Um, because, uh, you know, the moments of of uh, dialogue between uh, Paul Dano and, and um, Daniel Radcliffe were absolutely lovable. They were just so great together. They had so much chemistry. The Michel Gondry vi style visuals, uh, you know, the the um, the music, all of that was perfect. So it was hard for me to hate it. But the dad stuff was just like so shoehorned in there. Yeah, uh, really I think was. it was all kind of. So let me ask you. Well, so they're stuck in the woods. I'm just going to go ahead and wrap this up real quick for plot for the, sure. for the yeah, listeners. So we can get and then we can go back and, and then I can start getting to some of these specifics that yeah. we need to talk about. So eventually they they spend all this time in the woods. Um, Hank uh, ends up jogging, uh, you know, bringing uh, Manny to believe that he's got this lost love. Hank, uh, excuse me, Manny finds out that it was Hank's lost love and he was talking about himself the whole time. So he kind of feels duped. Uh, they end up getting out of the woods and all of a sudden we uh, stumble into uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Uh, I believe her character's name is Sarah. Uh, we stumble yes. into her backyard and there she is. We, all of a sudden, boom, like we thought we were on a deserted island. We thought we were had washed up on shore uh, in this long lost area, whatever. Uh, we've been roaming around trees and redwoods for the last hour. And then all of a sudden, boom, we're in a backyard in a suburban neighborhood um, yeah, and that's that after the uh, bear USA. attack scene, if you recall, where they he uses his right, magic right. farts to like you know blast them off or whatever. The the movie is rife with humor. Uh, in again, leading up to the name of the film, Swiss Army Man, where Manny is used a million different ways to yeah. get uh, Hank out of certain predicaments. Not the least of which is explosions with farts, uh, <laughs> water propulsion. I mean, any ways that you could use a dead corpse. Hank uses it, but we end up in Sarah's backyard and now mm -hmm. he's confront, uh, confronted by her. She's basically startled and frightened. She obviously doesn't know who this person is, even though uh, we've seen throughout the whole film, he has multiple photos of her on his cell phone. Uh, he has re um, reenacted this scene on the bus uh, that he, we see him reminiscing about through flashback. And then he, you know, reimagines that the scene we listened to earlier uh, so then we get there, and obviously she's unaware of any of this. We kind of are, were led to believe that 
uh, she was the one that got away or yeah. she was a long lost love or a girlfriend or whatever. And then mm-hmm. she doesn't even know who this guy is. And he's a total creep. We also see in the beginning of the film, he's full castaway mode with a big old beard and scraggly hair and unkempt and uh, disheveled clothing. And as the movie goes along, he gets more and more well-dressed. He's clean shaven. His yeah. hair is cut and groomed. I love so the, uh, I love the scene, by the, the way, backyard. where he's actually shaving and he like, he uses Daniel Radcliffe's teeth and he like opens his jaws and like <laughs> scrapes it across his cheek to shave. I thought that was wonderful. Fantastic. Go so on. by the time he stumbles into the backyard and and uh, then he's just a weird dude with a corpse and pictures of her on it, <laughs> yeah, like a total right. creeper. And um, a, a, a father is called. The father is called to, to uh, check on the the situation and all of that, and then that all plays out. So uh, and, and then in the end, he ends up running away and setting Manny free. He with a with a loud uh, fart, he propels himself back to the open sea from whence he came. Uh, and the beach they washed up on in the beginning. Uh, we find out that beach is really only a couple minutes away. It's not very far away from her backyard. It takes him not very long to get back there. He's in uh, chased by cops in tow uh, throughout the woods um, because, you know, cops were called and all of this. Uh, news reporters were there. It turns out to be this big media fiasco. And then Manny farts himself back to sea. They all have a sentimental moment where they hug it out and roll credits. So... That's kind of what you're left with. That's my problem with the storytelling. I don't know why I expected it to wrap itself up in any sane way versus how it opened itself. But Mm -hmm. uh, I thought the dad stuff going, I I wanted to finish that thought because uh, I wanted to really kind of hammer in where I thought the dad stuff was the weakest. And that's when they started introducing as long as it be, uh, as long as it was Manny and Hank hanging out in the, in the woods and, and having these moments and the conversation and their journey together. I was all in the second he came up yes. in the backyard and he turned out to be a creep. I didn't even mind that twist, but just the way the other characters acted off of that. Uh, I thought that was very unbelievable. I thought the dad wasn't very good. Um, the reporter, just how everybody like handled that situation acting wise, I thought was kind of vacant and left me kind of wanting more maybe thoughts. He- yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. It was it was kind of like, <laughs> you remember that moment in Wayne's World? I think it's two. It might be one, but it's like the where he go where he stops by the convenience store and there's like that. He's asking for directions to Gordon Street and there's that shitty actor and he's like, hey, time out. Like, I know this is a very small part, but like, can we get a legit actor <laughs> here? And then they bring in like Charlton Heston and he's like, Gordon Street. Ah, yes, Gordon Street. That's, like, that's, fantastic. What, that's exactly that's, what that's, I thought. That's I was such like, a great reference. Yeah, I was like, I was like, you got you got some like Dabney Coleman looking motherfucker who like has like a quarter of his acting skill and he's just kind of here and this whole subplot's undercooked and like well, I, like I said, I think he's supposed to be something of like a, a Chris Cooper type of domineering uh, American beauty type of dad, you know, um, you know, yeah. where, and it's just like his, you know, his oppression. But none of that comes just, through. Yeah, he doesn't love him. But and then and so and this and is in all part, fairness, he's got about a minute and a half to like wrap up this huge character arc that's been yeah. set up for the entire movie of neglect and abuse or yeah. you know, just uh, disin- uh, disinterest. And all of a sudden it's like, OK. Uh, so you got a minute and a half on screen. Go ahead and give me all that real quick to wrap up that storyline, that through point. It's like uh, you should have just either. You, I don't know. No, I, I, I agree with you alone. completely. I and I think that what the movie could have done is I think that I think that over the course of that second act, there should have been a lot more examination of that relationship. Like we should have heard a lot more about the abuses and the traumas and the neglect, whatever it is, because all we know is that. Somehow, some way, like this dad fucked this kid up, right? Like the movie very strongly hints that ultimately it's their relationship that drove this kid to be crazy and feel unloved. And but you haven't told us what's there, even if even if even if even if even if you don't want to tell us explicitly in the name of artistry, like there has to be clues there. We have to be able to look at elements and say, oh, okay, more than likely, because Look, if you tell us that, for example, Hank was sexually abused by his father, that gives the ending a very different resonance and poignance, right? If he was just kind of a dick and kind of ignored him, that gives it a different play. If he was physically abusive towards him, right? So the nature of the trauma 
that Hank experienced at the hands of his father would have given us much more pathos, right? Because at the end, it's kind of just like, oh, this guy's banana pants crazy. And yeah, you know, even though there were all these sort of sweet, tender moments earlier on, like dude's legit batshit crazy, like d definitely needs to be put in a hospital, go to jail, blah, 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 whatever, right? Whereas if we had known the extent of the abuses that Hank experienced, we would have been much more sympathetic at that end, you know? We'd be like, wait, but this is it's this is a travesty to... because, you know, his dad screwed him up so much. And why is it that, you know, Hank's being punished and his dad's right there getting away scot-free? Like, there could have been so much more going on there that was left unexplored, much to the movie's detriment, I believe. Yeah. It was all kind of told uh, to us through the lens of... Uh his mother passing away at an early age and yeah. how he missed his mom and how he was left alone with his dad who didn't give a shit and blah, blah, blah. And so his dad just kind of seemed like more vacant and neglect, uh, yeah. neglectful and uh, just kind of not wanting, uh, never like, Oh, I never, he's kind of one of those stereotypical movie dads where it's like, I never asked for this, you know, type of thing. He was left with the kid and uh, the mom's gone now. And uh, sure. So but now he's the same a partner. He's kind of like an absentee father type of thing, situation, whatever. And so I think that just kind of like added another layer onto Hank's loneliness and isolation because he missed his mom. And um, you know, he, he, was losing, you know, and his dad didn't really do much to fill that void. I never really felt like he was abused or anything like that. He, and when he saw his dad show up in the final scenes of the film, he wasn't angry. He was more awkward or ashamed, like, oh, shit. And yeah. uh, because, okay, and I wanted to ask your opinion on this moving on. Um, do you, so is it your interpretation? I know this is all kind of left to the viewer's interpretation. Mm -hmm. Was it your interpretation, uh, Jason, that um, this was all, in his head. So was he just a weird, awkward person, human man, kid that, um, was socially ill prepared for love or romance or whatever. And, uh, had all these, uh, collective experiences that he built up in his mind around a moment where he saw Sarah. And so then he, you know, ran away and, and, uh, uh, into the woods and, and tried to kill himself and found a dead body and personified this dead body and uh, and you know, had all these adventures with it. Like, is that kind of what, from a literal standpoint, is that what you think happened? That Yeah, so I believe that this story is all a figment of his imagination. Um, it's kind right. of, yeah, it's sort of, I think it's got that, you know, Mulholland Drive adaptation, like protagonist experiences trauma, but rather than deal with the reality of their situation, they basically invent an alternate reality in their head that is much more sure. desirable that, you know, makes moves the onus of their situation and predicament away from them and places it on other people. They're victims of this, that, the other forces larger than themselves, what have you. Um, I think that, so there's two decisions that I dislike that the, the filmmakers made, and it's both, it's primarily a screenplay, but also a directing decision, which is that in terms of the world that's been created, again, assuming, which I believe that, yes, this is all a manifestation of, in, of stuff that's in his head the same way that, you know, the bus wasn't real and the theater wasn't real and all of these things. Um, I think that he created this situation in his head and the filmmakers break that reality twice. The first is that Manny physically carries Hank to Sarah's backyard. So is this a fight club thing where like, oh, sometimes Manny's real, sometimes he's not, sometimes Hank is Manny. Like the movie stayed pretty consistent with regard to that, but all of a sudden We've got Manny carrying Hank, which, again, he's a dead body as far as the ultimate reality is concerned. So we can chalk that up to just being, I suppose, in Hank's head, but there's some questions there. And then the other scenario, the other situation moment is at the very end, yeah, where the body takes off into the distance and everybody sees it as real. And it's just, it's such a... It's almost a cliche, but it's such like one of those, you know, indie sort of filmmaker first time things of like, oh, I'm just going to throw this in here at the end. Not because it makes sense for the story. I think it's just the director's like Shyamalan moment of like, ah, what a twist. He's actually maybe real. And it's like, no, no, he's not. Because 
nothing else about your movie works. So you shoehorning this moment into the end invalidates the entire structure that you've set up. Because if this is real, then nothing we just said is valid. If this is real, then he's not insane and he's not going to the hospital and all this stuff really happened and it very clearly didn't. Um, so, right. You know. But the, but I'm going to go ahead and interrupt you and just say that you're talking about Shyamalan because I feel like uh, everything about this movie works except that. It's, this yeah. is a weird occurrence where this doesn't really negate this being a good movie. Correct. Uh, oh, yeah, 100 The last 30 seconds of the film. And the whole movie's so apeshit bonkers anyway that, you know, all the different ways that they get out of all these sticky predicaments as Manny is a Swiss army man and uh, all the things they do together and adventures like by the end when he just shits himself across the uh, open sea, I didn't really care. I just felt so good about the film in general. I think the only thing that bothered me is again, the endearing looks um, because at this point there he's joined on the beach by uh, Sarah, her fiance or husband or boyfriend of some kind or male partner. I think it's a husband. They got a kid um, together. Who is, yeah, okay, uh, but he seems pretty fucking concerned why this weird <laughs> creep that just stumbled out of the uh, woods with a dead body has his wife's pictures all over his phone yeah. uh, after he discovers that, and the dad, who is probably equally confused, and they're all just kind of like endearingly look at Manny, just shit himself across the open sea of the sunset, <laughs> roll credits. And um, that, I think the character, you know, just the, it was such a flop for me to see this big build up of the twist of isolated on a beach near suicide to, you know, explaining to Manny all these things. And then it turns out it was him the whole time. And all of a sudden now there's this confrontation and it's like, Oh shit. And then, and they're just like, yeah, but it's the movie's not about that. The movie's about shitting yourself across the sea and that's how it started. And that's how it's going to end. Damn it. (laughs) uh, Fuck our character development. So I don't know, man, the dad thing especially got to me. I could even see if if they removed that dad piece altogether and the dad didn't show up at the end and it was just Mary Elizabeth Winstead and uh, her husband uh, on the beach with him. And that all happened. I think I would have bought it more for correct. Yeah. No, that's adding the extra element of the dad in there. Just men like, and the reporter and everything else was like, dude, it, I don't know, man. No, you're absolutely right. If they had left the dad out, the movie would not have suffered. Like, that's 100% certain. And arguably, it would have benefited. Um, yeah, the, the the interview, like, that was weird. So, I don't know. You felt like there was, again, like, they had this idea or they were referencing some specific moment that they just, like, for sure had to shoehorn in there at the end. Uh, it definitely doesn't feel organic. Um You mentioned this earlier. I think that ultimately this is a film where the individual scenes themselves are sort of stronger than the overall experience maybe as a whole. It's still a very, very good movie. Don't get me wrong. It's like arguably a four to four and a half out of five star film for me anyway. Um, I'm just I'm just we have to acknowledge that it's not 100 percent perfect. Um, But, you know, the. When you're watching it, like when you're watching it, it's a five star movie. You know, as you're watching it, you're nothing less than enthralled. It's not really until, you know, after the fact, whether it's later that day or the next day, where you kind of have some time to start picking things apart, where you're like, well, this didn't quite add up and this didn't. But the filmmaking itself is so is so raw and so arresting that you're not really thinking about these things as they're happening. And kind of to that, uh, you know, kind of to that degree, um, I think that also because the individual moments as a film are really what's being celebrated, you know, that message is reinforced by the characters. And I think that's why we see Manny and Hank being so constantly impressed and in awe and in wonder of all these very small moments. Um, You know, the structure of the film itself does that very thing. And it's actually interesting when at the end, so uh, right before the reveal when, you know, they're in the tree and we get the headlights, which, by the way, I was very surprised by that. I did. I really enjoyed the moment where they're in the trees and, and the headlights do show up. I was legitimately surprised by that. So that was a nice reveal. Um, but, you know, Manny has a very sort of tender and poignant discussion where he's talking about basically everything that makes him human. He's not allowed to do back home, you know, and Hanks chastised him for. You know, his talking about him being open with masturbation and the farting, etc. And he's like, he's hugely offended that Hank never farts in front of him. You know, whereas Hank's like, look, that's right. just not socially acceptable. But he's like, look, this is like one of the most basic elements of being human. And if you can't be human in front of me, like, what's the point? So I actually, 
do have a clip of that scene. Uh, we're going to go ahead and listen to that real quick so you can see kind of what we're talking about. So let's listen to Daniel Radcliffe waxing about all of the rules that he has to abide by back home. Hey! Hey, look over here! Please help us! What is this? Those are cars, Manny. I you get know those are fucking cars. I'm talking about life. What is life? Oh, Manny. What is that flashing in my head? Is... Are you crying? I don't know. Is this crying? I don't like it. It's wet and uncomfortable. And oh God, why am I shaking now? It's crazy. This is normal. Just try to think about happy thoughts. <laughs> Benny, whatever you are doing, please stop. I'm just thinking. Well, stop thinking. I can't help it. This is a thought. And this is a thought. And this is a thought. 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 These are all thoughts. And sometimes thoughts become other thoughts. Thoughts like if my best friend keeps his farts from me. is he hiding from me? And why does that thought make me feel so alone? Manny, we have to try to think about something else. Is it healthy to fixate on these things? I just had a thought about a thought. How do you hide your thoughts? And why do we have to hide everything? So yeah, so the film has a lot to say about these sort of, like I said, small moments and our nature and, you know, what it is to be human and celebrate being human, etc. And look, like we said earlier, there are some major screenplay issues here at play with regards to the dad and a lot of the reveals and everything, the ending neither of us liked. But I long say that, like, a film is kind of like building a character in an RPG, right? Like you've got so many attribute points and you've got so many disciplines that you can put those attribute points toward, right? So if you basically break filmmaking down into the categories of like direction, screenwriting, cinematography, acting, and then maybe like sound and score, right? Like this movie nails four of those five. Like, the direction is brilliant, the cinematography is gorgeous, the acting is wonderful, the sound and score is brilliant, the way that all those come together. It's it's a wonderful movie. It just has some screenplay issues that ultimately prevent it from being arguably like an all-time classic or, you know, a five-star film. What do you think about that? Right, yeah. I mean... I, I'm only pointing out some of these bad moments because I'm on a podcast. If you would have stopped me in the street and asked me what I thought about this movie, I'd tell you it's fantastic and go watch this immediately. I love this movie. I started off saying that. I'll end the uh, conversation by saying that I love this film. Um, I stand by that. The moments are great. The acting is great. The music is great. And it's just a, a feel good. Like the whole time, I'm just uh, really enthralled at what these two guys are doing in the woods. It's... uh you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I really, really enjoy this film in the same way that I, again, in the same way that I enjoy movies like Kings of Summer or, or Hunt for the Wilderness, Wilder People, or, you know, some of these other movies that uh, are kind of similar to that. 100%. So let's go ahead and wrap this up with uh, our new little mini feature that we're doing here. Three adjectives. Ryan, give me your three adjectives that best describe this film. Isolated, helpless, redeeming. Very nice, very nice. For me, I think the three adjectives that best sum this film up, tender, arresting, banana pants crazy. <laughs> so There's nothing tender about that cock compass, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'm trademarking cock compass, so uh, nobody out there. <laughs> Dude, the alliteration on that is solid, man. Cock compass, I like that. Hey guys, stick around. We're gonna bachelorette go to a... party gift of two thousand twenty-one. Get your new bride a cock compass. <laughs> stick around, guys. We're gonna be right back after the break. Hey there, Timmy. You look down. 
Something on your mind? I'm bored. Bored? Out here on the beach? Well, that's no reason to go tying a rope around your neck, Billy. It isn't? No. Why would you need Johnny as a genuine bona fide formaldehyde filled Swiss Army man? Swiss Army man? What's that? Why, it's only the greatest toy to ever wash up on shore. That's what. Come on, Tommy. Let's see what he can do. Oh, boy! Say, Bobby, do you ever get thirsty out here underneath the sun? Do I? <laughs> of course you do, Roddy. That's why every Swiss Army man comes equipped with a water-based projectile vomiting feature. Just depress the hollow chest cavity and watch as Swiss Army Man forces gallons upon gallons of water out of his esophagus and all over your waiting body. Cool! It sure is, Jimmy. And you can trust that whether dehydrating from thirst or waterboarding the shit out of your enemies, Swiss Army Man will be there to help you when you need him most. <laughs> it's like my sprinklers at home, but with human bile! Careful there, Toddy. Save some of that bile for the rest of us. If I have to. Now cheer up, Bobby. I haven't even told you the best part. Say you wanted to cross all the way across the ocean to that other island out there. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> Not with those calves, Debbie. But you could if you had a Swiss Army man. Really? Sure. That's because every Swiss Army man sold comes equipped with its very own never-ending supply of flatulence power that will let you set sail across the seas to your heart's content. Go ahead, Tammy. Hop on board and give it a shot. Okay. Here goes nothing. Yeah! <laughs> this is awesome! Careful with all of that methane, Susie. You'll make that hole in the ozone layer even bigger. So get your Swiss Army Man today. And remember, if you've experienced trauma at the hands of your dad, get yourself a Swiss Army Man. All right, Ryan. So a couple really interesting films. Uh, one film that both of us loved and one film that both of us hated. That being said... We are going to try to compare and contrast them right now. So, seemingly on the yeah. surface, Fritz the Cat and Swiss Army Man could not be more different. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that much is apparent, right? So, but that being said... I mean, equal amount of penis references, I guess, but uh, <laughs> other than that... Yeah, that, the bodily fluids ratio or something, right? But um, yeah, either yeah, way, we're going to... something there. <laughs> we're going to try to find out what makes these two films similar? So, Ryan, did you find any comparisons between these two films? You know, so here's the thing. When you pitched this podcast to me and you approached me to be a part of this, uh, I was, you know, I'm forever grateful. Uh, <laughs> I, I really didn't know how this part of the thing was going to work. I was like, dude, compare and contrast. And then I saw the list and I was like, this is going to be dumb. I got to say, <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm i finding way more uh in common with with these movies than you would think um yeah and these movies could not be much different uh you know they, look these two characters are to me victims of their times they're lost causes that mm. that impact others in various ways um to me fritz the cat you know stayed in the game and did not isolate himself and let society kind of whisk him up in it and did what uh you know, he just kind of like uh, neutrally impacted others and went along for the ride without taking a stance or doing what was right in any given moment mm. uh, until he, you know, stopped the bomb, I guess. But uh, even then he admitted what, you know, that wasn't for the right causes. So sure. uh, whereas Hank um, ultimately removed himself from the situation, he um, was impacted by, again, the isolation and the loneliness and all the things of his times that uh, were impacting him and his, from his societal uh, stance. And... Um, from his surroundings, rather, and uh, and yet he removed himself from the entire situation, and then at the very end, thrust himself back in uh, to that very same situation, and we got to see how that worked out. Not mm -hmm. very good. Yeah. So both these movies are batshit crazy. Both <laughs> these movies uh, take liberties with reality and let you kind of stretch 
the suspension of disbelief to get yourself through them. Um, so, yeah, I think that they're very, very similar. It's just uh, the difference to me is how the main characters uh, chose to deal with their societal uh, surroundings and uh, some of the influences and things that were impacting them of, uh, around their time. Thoughts? Yeah, definitely, man. I think that I think that you're spot on with that. And uh, we'll get to the, the contrasts here in just a, a minute. But um, yeah, I think that for me, sort of the one thing that I found, so there's a few different observations that I made about the similarities in these films. And, and yeah, again, I totally back your point up. Like, I, I wanted this to be a sort of challenge and it was, but at the end of the day, I was like, you know what, if, if we're looking at it through a lens where we're trying to build those connections, like we'll do that because that's literally what the brain is designed to do. The human brain's constantly trying to find connections. So by putting ourselves in that, in that state of mind, you know, I think that we are making some really interesting observations and um, you know, perhaps if, if more people out there, you know, hold up some properties to one another that maybe wouldn't naturally seem like they fit they'll find a lot more of those similarities so anyways back to it so for me one of the things that i recognized is that both of these films argue that the sort of point of life if you will is ultimately the pursuit of happiness and specifically achieving that happiness through shared connection as well as being present and uh showing appreciation for those moments right now the way in which this is expressed looks very different because Fritz ultimately is a guy or a cat rather <clears throat> that just desires ultimately sex and drugs, right? Like he just wants he's to. He's got get... a dick. He's a he's definitely a guy. We saw a dick. <laughs> yeah. So he just kind of wants to get high and bang, right? But the thing is that it's not like he wants to, you know, like bust lines by himself in like a toilet stall. Like he's trying to like smoke a doobie with like a bunch of different people, right? And even, you know, that act in and of itself sort of becomes a, a ritual of connection in that degree, uh, to that degree rather. Um, you know, we see it in the way that he, you know, ends up banging like all these different people in the bathtub and getting high with them and whatnot. So um, even though, you know, it's these base desires of like sex and drugs, like ultimately the sex is about, you know, human connection or cat connection, if you will, as is the drugs. And we see that same desire in Hank, you know, br uh, regardless of whether we fully understand his motivations or not. The fact of the matter is that he does want human connection. He pines for it. He needs it in his life. He's been lacking it right. and it's affected him to the fact that he wants to kill himself. But it's that shared human connection that ultimately gives him a reason to live. Um, and so right. I think that we see those similarities. The other couple things. These are both films that rebel violently against the status quo, both with regards to, you know, the way they tell their story as well as the stories in and of themselves. Fritz, obviously, the sort of takedown of modern society that's, you know, peeling back the glossy veneer to reveal, you know, reveal the rotten interior, so to speak, and, you know, really just expose like, nah, man, this is how people really are type thing, right? Um, and Swiss Army Man, just with its eschewing of, like anything resembling traditional genre conventions, you know, just uh, obviously this is a film that takes, you know, adventure, comedy, drama, and even romantic elements. I mean, we didn't even, we didn't even mention the fact that like Hank literally kisses a dead body while dressed up as a woman. Like he's banana yeah. pants crazy, but it's done so sweetly and through his psyche that is very tender that the film gets us to buy in on these things that we really ultimately shouldn't. So again, um, just both films that buck anything remote, remotely trending toward cliche. And the final note, as far as comparisons are concerned, is that I think that both films do ultimately embrace this idea that reality itself is harsh and it's ugly, you know, in Fritz, it's kind of okay with it, but you know, the reality of New York city is always, you know, it's a very grimy, very dirty, the way it's visually represented. Uh, the audio itself, you know, is very tinny and and, and of, of lower quality. And, you know, it's not polished. Everything is really just, you know, quote unquote real. And real means, you know, ugly, unpolished, all of those things, right? Uh, and to the same degree, the reality of Hank's situation is incredibly unfortunate it's you know he's insane and all of these moments of wonder and beauty that he keeps referencing like are ultimately thoughts that no sane person would have like he is going to be committed after this film is over so 
while he's <laughs> in fantasy world with Manny through traipsing through the forest, everything's all beauty and wonder. And the moment that he comes to real life, it's like, oh no, you're batshit crazy and you're getting locked up. So, um, yeah, that's kind of I think where maybe, the comparisons I maybe because they saw that they saw that corpse shit his way across eh, the sea too crap, so maybe dude. not like i said dude that's just one of those like <laughs> young filmmaker like oh i'm gonna twist it up at the, like no dude no it's all in his head there is no doubt about that again because in order for if that's real then everything else was real and the entire movie falls apart and there's no reason that anybody <laughs> should so you think he imagined that ending that's how once he got out of the woods that's how he imagined uh, everyone being like oh it's okay no like i said when honestly all the way to the loony bin i just feel I, I just feel like it's a filmmaker's decision that's not even motivated like it's just like a, ah what a twist right. you know like i don't think it so you you refuse to even acknowledge that ending. You're like that movie ended to me. Correct. That movie faded to black at the at the reporter interviewing him, which by the way would have been a cooler ending to me. Yeah, yeah. I I, I honestly, I you know, you put it that way, but yeah, it's kind of true, man. Like <laughs> I'm going to tear Tarantino this thing. I reject the premise of your your question or ending or whatever. <laughs> So basically, I guess to summarize, uh, it's, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Just take some responsibility about that pursuit of happiness, kids. Don't just (laughs) dive right into the old pursuit of happiness, because these are both cautionary tales in their own way, and how your pursuit of happiness could go terribly awry. (laughs) Yeah. You're either going to end up uh, starting a race riot or stumbling out of the woods with a dead corpse to your uh, love interest house. (laughs) Uh, One way or another, not good ending for you. So, so uh, Ryan, real quick, you know, uh, even though these films are very different on the surface and even to a degree at their, um, you know, inners, like what about these films differed in your eyes? Oh, no. Well, I mean, I think I wrapped that up all in one. I, I mean, for me, it's it's uh, uh, the similarities and the I mean, the differences are what they are. I mean, you could <laughs> kind of come right out and say one's uh well i mean one's got boobs uh lots of cartoon <laughs> boobs one's a little more explicit in its tell uh telling of said cautionary tale one's definitely uh, a lot more innocent and sweet you know never uh during swiss army man did i feel like awkward and squirmy or dirty or like i need to take a shower and fritz the whole time like the entire <laughs> movie from the moment it started i just wanted to shower and and for, i felt uh unclean about the whole thing so yeah. uh yeah i think fritz is uh you know, telling of that cautionary tale was a lot more violent and shocking and in your face. And I mean, it was rated X and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the other one was rated PG 13, which I guess in seventies culture was only three years difference. So I guess <laughs> a lot happens between 13 and 16 <laughs> as we found out today. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's for sure. Hey, so, uh, the one thing I will say is that I think that just, you know, to sort of like identify a specific contrast, these are two protagonists with two polar opposite worldviews. And what I mean by that is like Fritz is kind of, you know, I used this reference earlier, like he's kind of like the shitty teenager that's just unimpressed with everything and like nothing's ever good enough. And whether you're liberal or conservative, you suck and you're lame. And whether you're old or young, you suck and you're lame. And like he's just going to find a way to shit on everything because at the end of the day, he just doesn't really want to do anything with his life. Right. He's kind of got that like. 60s 70s drifter mentality sort of thing that's going on you know so um whereas on the flip side you have hank and throughout the film until the very end like hank is fascinated by everything these very very small moments and to a lesser degree manny is as well but they're constantly finding just wonder and beauty and awe in the most mundane and trivial of actions whereas you know that's what makes them lovable yeah exactly you know whereas um you know, Fritz is just, like I said, going to shit all over everything. And then from there, we also see that res- re- reflected in the filmmaking, you know. So Bakshi wanted to make his, you know, gritty, raw, realistic, you know, not polished, blah, blah, blah. And he definitely achieved that. But as a result, Fritz the Cat has an ugly veneer, the film Fritz the Cat. It's 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 kind of, again, dirty with the visuals and it just doesn't feel pretty and clean. And that was his point. Whereas, on the other hand, Swiss Army Man does feel all of those things, at least for as long as we're in Hank's head, and that's a reflection of character. So, I do feel like both of these films, at the end of the day, for better or worse, they did achieve what they set out to achieve. Both films are banana pants crazy. 
One, a lot more enjoyable for both Ryan and I, but both not without their merits. I would also and, add, too, that uh, Fritz is more like, um, you know, uh, like a broad scope of demonstrating its points. Like, it, it takes you through a broad cast of characters, a broad landscape of worlds, cities. You're going all over the place. You're meeting all different people. You're seeing how uh, Fritz impacts all these people, whereas um, uh, Swiss Army Man is way more intimate. You know, you have Hank and, and Manny, and it's just the two of them, and it's uh, them reflecting or really examining on how other people fit into their world, how they miss other people. It's just, um, you know, very more you know, looking inward, whereas Fritz is more of an outward exposure of his experiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Nice summary. So, okay, well, that's going to wrap up our uh, film discussion segment. So, Ryan, this is kind of, I don't know, I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorite parts, man. This is where we get to uh, go ahead and random select the next two films that we are going to watch the for dice. our next episode. <laughs> yep, yep. And, and here- so, last week, I had a huge flub. Uh, I said Felix the Cat instead of Fritz the Cat. <laughs> I'm never going to hear the freaking end of it. Uh, my bad on that. Uh, I did not mean Felix the Cat. I wrote down Felix the Cat. I made my portion of the list very late at night uh, after some wine, and I wrote <laughs> Felix the Cat. And I read Felix, uh, Jason read Felix the Cat. I agreed to Felix the Cat. And then afterwards, I said, uh, I realized it was actually Fritz uh, that I wanted to watch. But yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay, with so that said, I think I've double checked my list now. I think we're all good, though, Jason. Oh, I think we can move forward with this. We are totally good. By the way, I have not told you this. And everybody else is going to hear this the same time that you're hearing this. So, obviously, Felix the Cat and Fritz the Cat, different letters for that second letter, right? Had we put in Felix the Cat as Fritz the Cat, it would have actually bumped it down, I think, two numbers on the list, right? The movie was is the list alphabetical. Yeah, the no, yeah, the list is alphabetical. So, so putting in Fritz the Cat would have dropped it down like two notes. Uh, two two yep. spots. The film that would have been selected without joking, exaggeration, anything would have been Fitzcarraldo. <laughs> now, I don't know if you remember you this, but Fritz we, had, we had talked last episode about like rigging the, ele- the, like, the selection process so that you could watch Fitzcarraldo yep. because we had watched Aguirre and you really wanted to see it. And I was like, oh, my God. And and as of right now, those are the only two Herzog films on the list. So, like, I don't know, man. There, 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 there's some there. But either way, um, so. I'm glad we didn't do that, though. Let's, <laughs> let's say I, two Herzog films. I would have been a nihilist. By yeah, that's, week, a, that, so, uh, that's a lot of existentialism to consume in, in a short period of time there. For sure. For sure. Right. Right. Um, by the way, uh, now I've. It was s- nice to get an animated film in there too. It's kind of neat how uh, how broad and diverse this list has become or is becoming. And of course, uh, anyone out there listening at this point, uh, we are going to be reaching out to you. Uh, hit us up on Twitter um, and uh, give us some give us some suggestions. Yeah, so you can follow us on Twitter at Esoterica Cinema, or if you're a little old school or just don't like being limited to 280 characters. You can always email us at esotericacinema at gmail.com. Like I said, give us some suggestions. Let us know how we're doing. We would love to hear from you. Anyways, we are now using a true random number generator instead of Google's half-assed generator. And uh, that's a random.org true number generator. Uh, I did a, I got a little, little, little frisky over the last uh, couple weeks and threw some new films on here, Ryan. So we are now up to 140 oh, films. Yeah. And it's, uh, we've sure. got a wide range, you know, again, looking right now, I'm seeing sweet, sweet backs, badass song right here. Um, yeah, yeah buddy. man, I'm, uh, I'm seeing Bronson. Um, I'm looking at Holy Motors. Uh, we got, you know, some indie fair portrait of a lady on fire. So, I mean, again, these are just films that are all over the place and kind of like you mentioned earlier at first when you're like, oh my God, I've got to put these two films next to each other. It seems really daunting, but once you allow yourself to a headspace where you can just kind of, okay, let me see what, you know, my conscious, subconscious, et cetera, draws in terms of parallels. I found it really surprising how 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 similar yeah, a lot of these it. seemingly disparate films are. And I'm really loving watching these uh, weird. These are all movies that I probably wouldn't other. I mean, there's so so much that I still need to watch or get to. There's new stuff coming out all the time, and uh, 
So to stop what I'm doing, slam on the brakes and throw myself back 30 years to go watch, you know, 40 years to go watch uh, Fritz the Cat, I'm not going to do that all the time. You know, that that yeah. was that'd be a hard judgment call to make on a Thursday night. But here we are <laughs> and you're having me do it. And uh, I'm not mad at you for it. <laughs> maybe maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit, <laughs> but not too mad. Uh, I like how that, I, I like how all of a sudden it's now my fault, even though you're the one that apologized at the top of the show. <laughs> <laughs> all right man enough jibber jabber Touché. let's see what our next films are here so roll those dice <laughs> all right film number one random generator Shh, kick us what you got number 116 okay so number 116 exists within the thes so there's like i don't know two dozen films maybe that start with the that are in the middle of this so 116 we come down Oh, man. Oh, I don't think I've seen this. If so, it's been a long time. 116 is The Lives of Others. Do you recall that one? Okay. That was a, the foreign nope. film about like the, I think it was kind of like The Conversation. It came out in the, the 2000s and some guy's spying or listening to like his neighbors or something like that. Um, I believe I want to say it was either like a Russian film, Hungarian film, something like that. But really, really well received at the time it came out. Um, I think that, you know, definitely history is forgotten. I don't 100% obviously based on that description recall exactly what it is. So this is going to be interesting. Um, if I saw it, I don't remember anything about it. How about you? Uh, yeah, I know nothing about that. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> we are going to be looking at the lives of others. And as we go to number two, number three on the list. Wow. Okay. Refer, yeah, we're we're up there towards the beginning. And for number three, we have, okay, Ryan, did you ever see A Cure for Wellness? No. This is Gore Verbinski, right? So, yeah, this this is a movie that came out, I believe, four or five years ago. Like Dane DeHaan or something like that, right? I think, yeah, it's kind of like, I think it takes place in like a mental hospital or something. And it's like got some sort of like Lovecraftian stuff going on. Like, um, it was a movie that was... That was actually pretty well received, but just I think it bombed, and you know history's kind of forgotten it. So, um, so yeah. So this is I don't be- know that it was well received. This is a post Lone Ranger Gore Verbinski. So Verbinski came off of doing The Ring. Uh, obviously, he was in a punk band and and had this great music career, and then he and he crushes doing The Ring, huge success, and uh, and then he does uh, you know the Pirates anthology. Yeah. Uh, knocks out of the park one of the highest grossing uh, some of the highest grossing Disney films of all time makes a small fortune overcomes huge uh, you know issues trying to make the movie and get it done over the water I mean it's just a, a feat of strength that he did that then he makes the Lone Ranger and everyone's like huh. <laughs> and it's game over <laughs> okay <laughs> right and then he goes away for a while man and then he comes back and does this cure for wellness and uh I was, I've always been curious about it. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Me too. Me too. Do you think that some studio exec... And Dane DeHaan's cool, man. I like Dane DeHaan. I, I wish he was in more stuff. Yeah, I can't say I'm super familiar, but do you think that like there was like a moment that Gord Verbinski had with a studio exec that was just playing the like Tom Cruise uh, role from... Uh, uh, what was the war movie? <laughs> uh Tropic Thunder, Tropic Thunder, where like the guy's like, hey, who's the director? And he like points him out and he's like, you, best boy, <laughs> punch him really fucking hard in the face for me. Just just really fucking hard. Right. Like like they lost like what? Two hundred and fifty million dollars plus marketing on Lone Ranger. Like like just studio yeah. exec took turn pummeling in the face, said, get out of here for 10 years. Come back. We'll give you a weird genre film. If it does anything, you can have a career again. <laughs> and apparently it didn't because he is since disappeared again well here's the thing man i mean for me and we'll talk about this next week but gore verbinski is at his best at his smallest you know yeah. uh like my meaner it's uh he did the ring he did the mexican he did the weatherman he did rango uh these are all great films man i love yeah. it and i love the first pirates of the caribbean i thought personally the bigger they got the worse they got they took us away from the characters and the heart and soul of the whole thing uh got really convoluted introducing all these new because every time they brought a new pirates out it was like okay now we need you know, uh, Davy Jones, or now we need a new, you know, salty dog character because the other one's part of the good guys now or whatever. So um, I-, I loved Mouse Hunt. I love the Mexican. I love the ring. Uh, I love Weatherman. I don't know if you've ever seen the Weatherman with Nick Cage, but that's a good I one. I haven't, no, but everyone, everyone um, speaks very highly of it. We we almost should add that to the list. It's a good one. Yeah. But, uh, 
anyway, I'm so all that to say that I'm I'm really looking forward to a cure for wellness. Uh, if this is like kind of a return back, kind of a scaled back uh, macabre story or something, kind of like a Shutter Island or something, I'm all in for that. Sweet, dude. Yeah, so uh, go ahead and uh, give both of those films a watch before the next episode, guys. Once again, The Lives of Others as well as A Cure for Wellness. Those are both going to be available online, streaming through one of the channels. Hopefully it's on Hulu or Netflix, but at the very least, you can always rent these films through you know, Amazon or, you know, I think Redbox online, you know, usually costs about three or four bucks, right? So yeah, that's our show for today. We will be back next episode where we will look at the lives of others as well as a cure for wellness. Really looking forward to that. Haven't seen either of those films. So thanks a lot for hanging out with us this episode. We will catch you next time, guys. From the imagination of acclaimed author Ashton McCauley comes the next great American anti-hero, Nick Ventner in Whiteout. Nick is a bit of a lush preferring whiskey to water and bar hopping to exercise. But when a mysterious benefactor hires Nick to find the lost gates of Shangri-La, Nick sobers up just enough to take on the case. Featuring non-stop action and a hilarious wit, Whiteout by Ashton McCauley is a laugh-a-minute thrill ride that will keep you turning the pages until the very end. Whiteout, available now in ebook, hardcover and paperback versions, online and everywhere books are sold. Published by Aberrant Literature.